Okay, I got seven o'clock. Call the meeting to order. Will the recorder please call the roll? Councilor Solsky? Here. Councilor Savage? Here. Councilor Fleck? Here. Councilor Stinnett? Here. Councilor Irvin? Here. Councilor Roberts? Here. Mayor Council? Here. There's no items to be added to the agenda. It brings us to item four, appearances of interested citizens for items not on the agenda. This is the time for citizens to comment on items not on, listed on the agenda for a maximum of 30 minutes. Individual speakers must be recognized by presiding officer, provide their name and address, and will be allowed up to five minutes or less with council approval. Comments regarding any matter scheduled for public hearing may be provided only in that hearing. Comments on agenda items may be taken prior to council's discussion on that item. Council will not engage in any discussion at this time or make any de decision based on public comments. However, council may take the comments under advisement for discussion and action at a further council meeting. I have a number of people that signed up and I'll take you in the list that I have you in order. So, Debbie Howell. Hear me better now. Um, Debbie Howell, um, in 36756 Sherby Drive, Serena, Oregon. And I have, it's more of a question. So I don't know, maybe y'all could, could help me with that. And it's on, I'm here on the behest of a, a senior family member of mine. I've been this family, been in this community here since dirt. I've been here forever. And and I have never been active here in any of the, the council. I think maybe, maybe it's about time that I start getting involved in what's going on in my community. Up and all my kids might be grown and whatnot. They're still in this area as well. And so the question that was posed to me by a very senior was she, another family member, drove her past the corner of Maine in 99 back when they were having the, um, the pediatric shop thing there on the corner at uh, Chamber of Commerce, I believe it was. And the, I then read in the following paper where a couple of gentlemen had written in and said that they had been called in by safe passage and security for that event. I'm not kind of thinking, was that not on city property? And if it's on city property, but we have a fine police department, would they not be the ones that would be called in? And also, too, who are these other people? What are their qualifications? Did Were they paid out of city funding? And I don't know if those questions will be answered to now, but I guess I was just kind of wondering, as a security or a safety person, can any organization come out of some city property and bring my own security with me? Um, this is not a spot where we're going to have a dialogue, but if you get with me after this meeting, we'll talk about it. Oh, okay, great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, I have uh, Rosemary Foraker. Hi, I'm here. Sorry, I don't have a <clears throat> visual of me. I'm sitting in my car, so. Um, do I need to state my name and address? Uh, no, I have it on the uh, your sign up. Thank okay. you. Um, uh, okay. It has been uh, nearly a year since uh, Climate Action Cottage Grove. I'm an organizer with Climate Action Cottage Grove. Since our organization has proposed the Carbon Challenge as a platform for real time accounting for carbon reduction in Cottage Grove. This platform is designed by Bright Action, and that is brightaction.com. Bright Action is a company that puts together a locally based website to track, make suggestions, and guide individuals and groups to reduce their carbon footprint. This site accounts and tracks savings to make progress obvious on a user friendly platform. We've been waiting for the city to sign the contract and get this site up and running for our community. Not only will this site provide a roadmap to a greener cottage grove, it will also track our progress as a city and community. The climate crisis is here and we need action from the city as soon as possible. 
we were informed by the organization that today the contract was finally signed. We are very happy that this has finally taken place. Now that the contract is signed, Climate Action Cottage Grove would like to see a Climate Action Committee sponsored by the city to get the work on initiatives that will make a real actionable steps to climate change preparedness and reductions in emissions as a city as well as a successful launch of the carbon challenge and all that the platform has to offer. One important step is a carbon inventory of our city as a starting point. We are happy to help with the organization that could do that for the city. Another step I would like to see is the city declare a climate emergency. This is a symbolic gesture that could have a real impact as our city leaders communicate to their constituents that, the, that they understand the severity and seriousness of the situation our planet and indeed this community faces in the years to come. Thank you for hearing my comments and I look forward to working with the city to make a real, to make real impacts on this issue. Thank you. Christina Hubbard. Well, Rosie just took some of what I was going to say and changed it. So now I want to thank, excuse me, thank you for signing the, um, <coughs> the Carbon Challenge Agreement. We really appreciate that. Um, it's going to allow us to really track our footprint and you'll be able to get community members and businesses and organizations on board and get everyone involved with this and with Rosie as well as with Boris Webb. So we're both committed to helping you with this project. Um, two years ago, uh, Climate Action Cottage Grove requested the city declare that climate emergency and, commit, and make a commitment to reach carbon neutrality by 2030. And at that time, I addressed the city council and encouraged you to take actions on this issue and to set an example for other towns and cities across Oregon. I'm going to ask that of you again tonight. Um, please declare a climate emergency, set the goal for carbon neutrality in Cottage Road, and thank you again for signing the climate agreement so we can get moving forward on this. Thank you. Rob Dickinson. Hello, I'm Rob Dickinson, and I am here also to urge the, the City Council and the community to take more action around climate change. First, I do want to thank the city manager and the city council for deciding to work with uh, community climate solutions to create a cottage grove climate carbon challenge. That's really important. This is an opportunity for residents of the city, businesses in the city all to work together to identify ways to save energy and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. I do understand the contract was just signed today and we're glad for that. And cottage grove climate action is ready to partner with the city to both educate the public about this opportunity and to help encourage people to participate. But I also want to encourage the city to do more. The climate crisis is the greatest crisis that our generation will face in our lifetime. The assessments continue to show that the results of acting too slowly to reduce our greenhouse gases will be dire and cause immense harm and suffering. We are definitely moving too slowly. The consequences of climate change in one degree centigrade over pre-industrial baseline are stark. And those are, at, a, at this moment, a best case scenario. At this moment, we're well on our way to exceeding that by a wide margin. The 2021 IPC report shows that we will hit one degree centigrade um, by 2030 uh, over pre industrial baseline and two degrees by 2050. And the World Meteor Meteorological Organization now thinks we might hit one and a half degrees by 2050. So that's very soon. Some of the kind of impacts that we can look forward to, um, unless we do more, reduce stream flows by 40 to 60 percent. In the dry season by 2040, due to snow surface area increasing by 400 to 500 percent by 2040, and snowpack in the Cascade being nearly gone by 2040. The, the, the fifth Oregon climate assessment, which is a pretty um, in depth document, anticipates that the destruction of property, the disruption of daily life, the large cost of the economy, pollution of the atmosphere and water supply, and the impairment of human health damage to wildlife will worsen in coming years as the climate continues to warm more rapidly. We will have perhaps a six-fold increase in hot degrees, hot days over 90 degrees. 
that summers will be hotter and drier, and they'll start sooner, and they'll persist longer. We should declare, uh, actually, before I say this, um, I have friends who live in Greenville, California, and in, also in some of the surrounding small towns with Crescent Mills and Taylorville. They know all too well what happens uh, with Dixie Fire when wildfires are out of control. They lose their livelihood, they lose their buildings, they lose their homes. And, and we also know people in McKenzie who have experienced similar things. I want to encourage you to declare a climate emergency as a gesture that can take this seriously. We should follow the county's strong lead where they formed a committee and developed a climate action plan. We could do that too, and much of their work is work that we could leverage. Um, there are things that we can be done in the sector of transportation, buildings, waste management, and others. The most important thing is to start, start soon, to start in earnest, with a serious commitment to doing what we can as a city to be part of the solution. Few things will matter more to our children's futures than what we do starting now to address this crisis. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Fred Chambers. Ah, good evening. Yes, I, I agree with everything that uh, Rosemary had to say, so I'd like to second that. Uh, so thank you for signing the contract, and uh, I strongly encourage you to um, do this uh, climate emergency declaration, even though it's symbolic. I mean, just the events that we've had in Cottage Grove and, and in the surrounding areas, you know, the unprecedented snow event in 2018, Snowmageddon is what we called it. The, uh, in 2020, the unprecedented easterly winds that sparked multiple wildfires in Oregon, and we were sitting in toxic, uh, very unhealthy air for 10 days. Um, last year was a heat dome, and I guess that was this year, this uh, early uh, summer. The heat dome, which uh, 100, over 100 degree temperatures in a wide, wide area for a number of days, damaged crops, animals. It was, uh, it was traumatic for the, for the whole area. And all these events, people have died in these events. So it's, it's not like we're in a climate emergency every second, but these, uh, these events seem to be speeding up. And so we need to take some action. Um, then in the surrounding areas up in British Columbia, you know, they had the, the extreme flooding uh, just a month ago or less. And then the, the killer tornado back in Kentucky, maybe the, the most uh, strongest uh, tornado ever recorded. Killed over 70 people. One tornado was on the ground for uh, 200 miles. I mean, I grew up in the Midwest and uh, it's, it's never heard of you. Uh, tornado never stayed on the ground for uh, 200 miles in my lifetime. So these are all things that, uh, you know, you just open your eyes and take a look around, it's happening. And so I encourage you to make a statement by, uh, by doing this uh, emergency declaration. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. Dwayne Taddy. <clears throat> Dwayne Taddy, 77561, Highway 99, uh, Cottage Grove, Oregon, Unincorporated. Hey, I wanted to talk about Mookies. I have not heard any uh, talk about Mookies. Uh, and the reason I want to talk about Mookties is because of the recent application for a Mookie, a multiple unit property tax exemption for the piece of property that is on the south side of East Main across from the Walgreens. Um, the report doesn't state how much this is going to cost the city. Uh, at the end of the day, it really is a tax break, regardless of what anybody tells you. Uh, my take on it is if they can't afford to build and they need to wait, save up a little longer till they can. Um, there's so much talk about how many more Mookies the city of Cottage Grove can afford, all while there's so much talk at times when we do bring up Mooptees about changing the Mooptee to add real public uh, benefits, unlike what's in there today. Uh, it's as simple as uh, creating a bus stop in front of your property, and that's a public benefit. And I don't see a public benefit to that. We have enough bus stops. So anyways, uh, the, the problem I have with the current Mooptee that the city of Cottage Grove has is its lack of affordable or low-income housing component. Um, those are true public benefits to the people of Cottage Grove, especially with the housing crisis that we have all admitted that we have. Uh, towns like Silverton, Newport, 
and Eugene have uh, these middle income, affordable or low income housing components incorporated in their MOOPTIs. We don't. There's been talk amongst our counselors and, our, and the staff at city council to incorporate a, not, a non-profit uh, component to the MOOPTI. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about for-profit affordable income housing. If it can be done in other cities, it can be done in Cottage Grove. Uh, the lack of communication amongst counselors and staff and in the media is, is appalling uh, to say the least. So I'd like to see some more action. I think one of the problems is counselors don't know when the time is appropriate to discuss this, whether it's at the beginning under, under, uh, or under new business or concerns from the council. So maybe a discussion into when city counselors should be able to uh, talk about these things. The second thing I wanted to talk about was the, um, the warming shelters. Uh, tonight, uh, several media sources are saying that it could get down to t as low as 28 degrees. This morning on the Beeper Show, I confronted uh, Jake Boone, assistant to the city manager, about the city's con maybe a possible concern that the city might have with these shelters not opening. A couple of weeks ago, the temperatures dipped to uh, below uh, 30 degrees and the shelters were not open. Um, the reason why I bring this, brought this up this morning was the community sharing website does say that the city uh, supports this program. And I know that they support them in many ways. And two of the ways are by giving them public property, a taxpayer's property to set up and also expenses that are paid for by the taxpayers. Uh, the, we, 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 are, we are owed an answer. Uh, I pay taxes in this town for 20 years. Uh, I don't plan on going anywhere soon. I'm not currently a property tax uh, payers since I moved just outside the city limits, but that doesn't mean that I don't shop in Cottage Grove and pay my gas tax and, and support the city of Cottage Grove. What I'd like is an answer. Is the city staff and the city council at all concerned that the shelters did not open last time the temperatures dipped below 30 degrees? And are they not at all concerned that there, there was no plan to open tonight? Um, I have a couple other things, but I know you guys have a long meeting. I just would bring those two. Those are the two most important issues, and I'll leave you with that. Thank you for your time. Thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so that's the last one on not on the agenda. So we're going to item five, public hearings. Item A, second public re hearing for ordinance number 3148, extending the economics and business improvement districts. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. So this is the second uh, public hearing for the extension of the term for the Economic Improvement District and the Business Improvement District. It is scheduled for this evening. All of the business owners in the BID were sent written notification of the proposed assessments, which is $100 per year. All the property owners in the EID for both tiers were sent their assessment amount, which varies from property to property depending on the size and if residential use is also provided. A public hearing notice was also published in the Cottage Grove Sentinel. And with the written no notification to the BID business owners and the EID property owners, a fact sheet was provided. The fact sheet is also attached to uh, this agenda item. So I wanna bring everybody up to date before the public hearing. So as of 5 p.m. Um, today, in the Economic Improvement District Tier 1, there are a total of 81 properties. 13 have submitted written requests for remonstrant out of the Improvement District, um, which represents 9% of the value. Uh, that's $2,434.09 um, out of a total uh, leaving a total of $26,737.48. In the improvement, <clears throat> Economic Improvement District Tier 2, there are 48 properties. Ten have submitted written requests to remonstrate, remonstrate out of the district. These ten remonstrances represent 14% of the Tier 1 value at $1,000, $1,624.11, and a total still in the district of $11,000. $647.98. Um, there also in the BID, there are 85 businesses in the in the business improvement district, and to date five have submitted written requests to remonstrate out, which represents six percent of the total value, uh, $500, 
um, out of uh, $8,600. So at the present time, um, the EBID, excuse me, the EID and the BID combined remonstrant percentage is at 10% of the total district, well under the 33% uh, percent needed to uh, for the council to consider approval. So um, if there are folks tonight in the public hearing that remonstrate um, staff, we will um, calculate that and give you that number when this item comes back for consideration of the ordinance. So at that time, that time I'll open the public hearing. Anyone wish to speak? Uh, I'd, uh, as the program administrator of EBID, doing business in downtown Cottage Grove, I should uh, I'll be declaring a conflict of interest and recusing myself from these proceedings. Thank you. Anyone wish to speak on the hearing? Seeing none, we will close the hearing. Okay. Brings us to item six, consent agenda. Move approval. Second. Have a mo motion with a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, um, second vote, uh, item seven is resolution ordinances. Item A is second vote of ordinance 3148, extending economic business and improvement district. Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the council's held, held the first public, uh, excuse me, the, the council held the first public hearing on October 25th 2021 and ordinance number 3148 was voted on uh, for the first for the first vote. Second public hearing was held this evening with no uh, comments um, ma made at the public hearing. Required notices have been made to every business owner and property owner in the two districts. They have been provided with a proposed assessment, all the remonstrances must be received prior to the conclusion of the second public hearing. More than 60 days have been provided for the remonstrance process. If 33% or greater of the district remonstrance, then the council cannot form and extend the district. The percentage of the remonstrance for the, both the BID and the EID, um, as I presented to you in the uh, public hearing, with no changes, um, the EID and the BID combined remonstrance percentage was 10% and the BID's uh, remonstrance was 6%. So both of those are well under the 33% required. So if if there's any questions, be happy to do my best to answer them. And if they're not, the council can consider the second vote and adoption of ordinance 3148. Councilor Fleck. Mr. Mayor, I move that the council adopt ordinance number 3148. Second. I have a motion with a second. Is there any discussion? Councilor Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, some of these businesses that have remonstrated have told me that they're, one of their reasons is the five-year plan. They would rather see a two or three-year plan and also um, an annual report of where the money is going and the improvements that are made within the business. I just wanna say that for food for thought. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any more discussion? Seeing none, will the recorder please tell the roll? Councilor Solsby. Aye. Councilor Savage. Aye. Councilor Fleck. Aye. Councilor Urban. Aye. Councilor Roberts? Aye. Mayor Gow? Aye. Give a second for Councilor Stenton to get back up here. 
So item B is first vote for ordinance annexing 2.68 acres identified as 78314 and 78310 Highway 99. Mr. Mongan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, councilors. Um, this uh, is an ordinance to annex 2.68 acres of land, uh, commonly known uh, as Fort Parcels, um, as the mayor said, 78314 and 78310 Highway 99, 78300 Highway 99, and 78278 Highway 99, uh, 78294, 78290, 78296, and 78282 Highway 99. The map and legal description of the area annexed is attached as exhibits A and B respectively to the ordinance. The ordinance, uh, this expedited process is being used pursuant to section 18.04.050 of the Cottage Grove Municipal Code. Notification was sent to property owners within 300 feet of the subject parcels on November 22nd and 29th, providing the required 14 day common period uh, to make comment or to request a public hearing with that period ending on December 13th at 5 p.m. As of 5 p.m. today, no written comments were submitted or, or nor were there requests made for a public hearing. The subject's parcels meet the criteria of 18.04.040, A through D. Staff, staff recommends that the annexation be approved and that the City Council hold the first vote on the attached ordinance. The ordinance was prepared and has been available for at least one week prior to this meeting. This ordinance could be adopted in one meeting. I get an ordinance number? 3150. Councilor Fleck. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I move that uh, the City Council adopt ordinance number 3150. Second. I have a motion with a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the recorder please call the roll? Councilor Solsky? Aye. Councilor Savage? Aye. Councilor Fleck? Aye. Councilor Stinnett? Aye. Councilor Urban? Aye. Councilor Roberts? Aye. Mayor Gowan? Aye. Item C is first vote for ordinance annexing a portion of Lane County Road number 27, Cottage Grove Lorraine Highway, and the portion of West Main Street between South S and South R Street into the city of Cottage Grove. Mr. Mongan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Lane County Public Works, owner of County Road number 27 and the portion of West Main between South S and South R Street in the southeast quarter and southeast quarter of section 29, Township 20, South, range three west of the Willamette Meridian, Lane County, Oregon, has applied for an expedited annexation procedure of approximately 370 linear feet of County Road number 27 and a portion of West Main Street. The purpose of this annexation application is to transfer the jurisdictional a jurisdiction of the right-of-way from Lane County to the city of Cottage Grove. The map and legal description of the area being, being annexed are attached to this exhibit uh, as A and B, respectively. The expedited process is being used pursuant to Section 18.04.050 of the Cottage Grove Municipal Code. Notification was sent to property owners within 300 feet of the subject right-of-way sections on November 22nd, providing the 14-day comment period. No uh, Written comments were submitted, nor were, was there a request for a public hearing made. Um, the right-of-way sections meet the criteria of section 18.04.040A through D. Staff recommends that the annexation be approved and that the city council hold the first vote on the attached ordinance. The ordinance was prepared and has been available for at least one week prior to this meeting. This ordinance could be adopted at one meeting. Councilor Fleck. Mr. Mayor, I move that ordinance number 3151 be adopted. Second. I have a motion with a second. Is there any discussion? Council Roberts? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, does this mean that we're now will be responsible for that bridge that goes over at the end there, that goes over the creek, uh, the one down off Gowdyville Road? Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's, it's my understanding that the bridge is not included in in the request of um, uh, 
what Lane County would would like the uh, city to transfer jurisdictions. My understanding, there's no that the bridge won't be part of that. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, will the reporter please call the roll? Councilor Solsby? Aye. Councilor Savage? Aye. Councilor Fleck? Aye. Councilor Stinnett? Aye. Councilor Urban? Aye. Councilor Roberts? Aye. Aye. Item D is first vote for ordinance annexing a portion of Lane County Road number 728 Airport Thornton Road into the city of Cottage Grove. Mr. Mongan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Lane County Public Works, owner of County Road number 728 in the southeast quarter of Section 27, Township 20 South, Range 3 West of the Willamette Meridian, Lane County, has applied for an expedited an annexation procedure of approximately 310 linear feet of County Road number 728. The purpose of this annexation is to transfer the jurisdiction of the right of way from Lane County to the city of Cottage Grove. The map and legal description of the area to be annexed are attached as exhibits A and B respectively to this ordinance. The expedited process is being used pursuant to 18.04.050 of the Cottage Grove Municipal Code. Neighbors, uh, notifications was, were sent to property owners within 300 feet of the subject right of way on November 22nd, allowing a 14 day public comment period and a time to request a public hearing. No public comments were submitted, nor was a request for a public hearing. The subject right of way section meet, meets the criteria of section 18.04.040A through D. Staff recommends that the annexation be approved and that the city council hold the first vote on the attached ordinance. The ordinance was prepared and has been available for at least one week prior to this meeting. This ordinance could be adopted at one meeting. Councilor Fleck. Mr. Mayor, move that the council adopt uh, ordinance number 3152. Second. I have a motion with a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, will the reporter please call the roll? Councilor Solsky? Aye. Councilor Savage? Aye. Councilor Black? Aye. Councilor Dennett? Aye. Councilor Urban? Aye. Councilor Roberts? Aye. Aye. Item E is an ordinance repealing the chapter 5.12 regarding tobacco retail licensing and sales regulation for Cottage Grove Municipal Code. Mr. Myers. At the November 8th City Council meeting, the City Council approved um, opting out of, of administering and managing and enforcing the new statewide tobacco licensing. Um, program and authorized the state to take that over and to run their program in Cottage Grove. Um, in this mode, we need to remove our ordinance um, that created a local um, tobacco licensing, retail licensing program so that there's no conflict there with our ordinance in the state law. And this ordinance would need to have a second reading later or a second vote. Councilor Fleck. Mr. Mayor, I move that the council have a first reading for ordinance number 3153. Second. I have a motion with a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, will the recorder please call the roll? Councilor Folsby? Aye. Councilor Savage? Aye. Councilor Black? Aye. Councilor Stanton? Aye. Councilor Urban? Aye. Councilor Roberts? Aye. Mayor Gallagher? Aye. Item F is a resolution granting a multiple unit property tax exemption update program for Matzer Development LLC for a seven unit cottage cluster development. Mr. Mongan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Before the City Council is an application for the MUPTI program submitted by the property owner Matzer Development LLC. Phase one of the seven unit cottage cluster development was considered and approved by the Planning Commission via Site Design Review Application SDR 6 21. The approved SDR includes the development of four cottage, cottages 
situated at the, at the southern portion of the subject property, located at the southeast corner of the intersection of East Main Street and South 17th Street. For this MUPTI application, the applicant has submitted per preliminary drawings for phase two, which include three additional cottages and a small commercial space located adjacent to East Main Street. Approval of phase two will be conditioned on the approval of a concurrent site design review and conditional use per permit applications in front of the Planning Commission. The City Council adopted ordinance number 3117 on December 9th, 2019 to support development of all types of multifamily, multifamily affordable housing market rate and government subsidized affordable housing through the use of tools to lower development or operational costs. The adoption of the MUPTI program was seen as a tool to encourage the development of much needed multi-unit housing within the city. The council also determined that the lack of development of multi-unit housing over the last 20 years demonstrates that multiple unit housing would not occur in this market without this program. This application meets MUPTI eligibility criteria. Specifically, location of the development site is on or within a quarter mile of an LTD route, and that there are three or more dwellings proposed within the development. As part of the MUPTI application, the City Council should review the public benefit components required in order to qualify for the exemption provided in Chapter 3.10. The applicant must propose and agree to provide one or more design elements benefiting the general public, but not necessarily the public at large. As stated in some subsection 3.10.050B, the applicant has proposed the following benefits. Commercial uses on the ground floor of a multi-unit housing structure, uh, commercial building adjacent to East Main Street as a conditional use um, under phase two. Um, bullet number eight, facilities for the handicaps, that's uh, development of um, ADA compliant facilities in the public right away at, at South Main Street and, and or East Main Street and on South 17th Street. And uh, number 11, development or redevelopment of a blighted property. The subject property was the site of a former single family dwelling that was demolished more than 10 years ago. And in the time since then, the city has had to regularly bring enforcement regarding nu nuisance code violations. The attached resolution has been prepared uh, for council adoption if the city council wishes to approve the MUPTI application. Uh, Recommendation is that the City Council consider whether to approve the attached MUPTI multiple unit property tax exemption program submitted by Matzer Development pursuant to Chapter 3.10 of the Cottage Grove Municipal Code. The application meets the criteria as outlined in Sections 3.10.020 and 3.10.050, showing location on or within a quarter mile of an of a bus route, three or more units, and public benefits of ADA facilities, mixed use development, and um, ADA facilities. Uh, if the City Council wishes this application, um, the resolution has been prepared for possible adoption. Uh, discussing the cost, the cost associated uh, with the approval of this application will be realized as revenues not received from the improvement value associated with the newly constructed seven unit multifamily cottage cluster for a period of 10 years, beginning on num November 7th, 2021. Uh, excuse me, there's an error there in that memo. Um, recently, the city received information on the abated tax value for two previously approved MUPTI applications. A letter from Lane County Assessment shows that for the developments at 1308 East Main Street, that's the triplex, um, had an exempted improvement, improvement value of um, just over $350,000, which abated $6,500 from the tax roll. Um, for this year. Um, and then the other one is a fourplex at uh, 2143 uh, East Whitaker, which had a exempted value of 300, almost $15,000, which remo uh, abated 5,700 off this year's tax roll. These numbers are being provided as evidence of the value of the program and cre creating new multifamily developments. Um, as discussed in previous uh, MUPTI applications, there are multiple paths that the county can use for evaluating and evaluating, uh, assessing the value of property and development. Um, but per uh, Joe Leak, the commercial appraisal supervisor at the county, all numbers are just estimates until the tax roll certification in October of each year. 
without the MUPTI program, these seven units and the commercial space would not would likely not be constructed, resulting in the loss of seven new dwelling units. An application fee of $840 was paid by the applicant to cover the costs associated with city, count, city council's consideration of this application. Okay, and I have uh, Mr. Matt Boozer signed up to speak on this. Oh, okay. Thank you. Do we have a resolution number if we move forward? 2058. Councilor Fleck. Mr. Mayor, I believe I heard 2058, and if so, I move that that resolution be adopted. Second. I have a motion with two seconds. Very discussion. If not, uh, will the recorder please call the roll? Oh, sorry. I really like this. Uh, I know we have discussed about talking about this MOOCTI program in the future. I think we're going to believe sometime next year we're having a housing thing that we're putting together. So, um, but this one's hard to deny till then. Um, I really like uh, Exhibit C, where these uh, college clusters are going to target the demographic of young working couples for their first home purchase and uh, downsizing older adults. Um, it's, it's hard to deny that, but I, I do look forward to having um, a, a talk on, on the MOOCTI and how it can benefit our citizens even more. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Any more discussion? Mr. Stewart? Thank you, Thank you Mr. Mayor. I would just like to add that um, we're in the final um, stages of, of uh, perfecting a contract with um, um, the uh, contractor through the DLCD grant that we received. Eco North, Northwest is the contractor that's going to be doing the work, and that is for the um, affordable housing implementation plan. There'll be a complete review of the um, current and approved um, multi unit property tax exemptions, and they will be. Um, recommending um, recommend making recommendations or changes to the code that uh, could uh, assist in more affordable housing directly. Um, there will be an advisory committee that will be created uh, that will include, I believe, at least two uh, city councilors, and there'll be two meetings along with this with, I believed, a completed um, plan to present to council, um, hopefully, by June of uh, 2022. Thank you. Any more discussion? Seeing none, will the reporter please call the roll? Councilor Tolsey? Aye. Councilor Savage? Aye. Councilor Fleck? Aye. Councilor Stinnett? Aye. Councilor Irvin? Aye. Councilor Roberts? Aye. Mayor Gow? Aye. Item eight, business from the city council. A, a bid award for flow monitoring services. Mr. Bradsby. Yeah. Sorry, everyone. Uh, thank you, your honor. Uh, the city uh, would, is uh, looking for services for flow monitoring uh, as part of our uh, master plan project upcoming. Uh, it gains valuable information about inflow and infiltration in our sewer system, as well as provides information as for modeling the system to see if pipes are undersized uh, and uh, different capacity components of uh, the city. Um, city um, wrote an RFP and sent it to four uh, qualified firms. We received three back, uh, and the fourth bidder said they would not make a proposal. Uh, lowest proposal was U.S. cubed uh, for $114,465. Uh, staff has done due diligence by calling uh, references as well as talk to the individuals to ensure their meters are accurate and there weren't any other hidden costs uh, to do this monitoring. And uh, uh, the references gave uh, 
US Cubed a glowing review. Uh, so staff is recommending uh, to council to authorize US Cubed for $114,465 for flow monitoring services for three months. Any questions? Councilor Savage. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Bradsby. I believe that you said on Friday that some of your numbers were inaccurate and you were going to get back to us. Was that, did I understand you correctly or uh, is there more information that needs to come to the table? Uh, Councilman Savage, uh, their original proposal was $116,000 and change. I believe they added material cost in twice. I've talked to them. Uh, they, they, you know, said they weren't too concerned. Uh, the cost, the other cost that I was worried about was um, since this is a non-contact technology in, in determining flow and height of flow and capacity, I didn't know if uh, they would be needing to split two meters in one location versus where I had planned only one. Um, I have talked to them and they said if they they will either move to a manhole above stream or they have the capabilities in certain locations to do two meters, uh, depending on how we want to gather the information at that point. And the additional meters, if we go over is approximately 40, $800 per each, and that will include materials, installation, and removal, and the renting fee for three months. So at this time, I have no adjustment to their bid except that $1,615. Thank you for the clarification, Mr. Bratz. Thank you. Irvin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I'm in support of moving forward with the, the low bid on this, but I do have a question. Uh, pertaining to the, I understand the frequency of these flow tests is uh, pretty spread out and that the equipment cost to do it ourselves is relatively high. Um, that's as much as I understand from this, but uh, I know, you know we have invested in smart meters just on at the individual residence uh, level. And I'm wondering down down the road if there's some strategic locations that we can constantly be monitoring uh, ourselves uh, for future growth, especially if we're slated for uh, above average growth, uh, where we might perhaps have to be doing this or keeping it on on the radar more often. Uh, do you have an idea what what the equipment cost is for one of these units, and if it can be tied into our existing uh, you know wireless monitoring system for other flow purposes. Councilman Irvin, um, I do not know. I can do some research to see the cost of these flow meters. Um, I know uh, I've talked to a couple of uh, the firms that we required the bidding and we found out like uh, city of Medford and some cities have bought in flow meters and they permanently install them so they can continually be monitored um, there I believe the understanding that I have from a couple of these proposals that we just received um, information is stored on the cloud and so um, yes I would say we have some way of monitoring the flow permanently and collecting data um, through the cloud service or Wi-Fi similar to our water meters Mr. Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Councilor Irvin, uh, our, I checked in with Census, who is the manufacturer of our automated water meters uh, quite some time ago um, and found out that they do actually offer and sell meters that would work in our uh, current automated system, but they're quite expensive. Um, it would be something that, uh, and I, I'm sorry, I don't have the number off the top of my head, but um, it is very possible to use our existing technology and plug in a, a sensence a moder monitoring meter. But um, when I discussed with Mr. Bradsby the number of meters needed, it was uh, much, much more financially, it made more sense to 
have a company come in and uh, do the three months at the present time. But if we, um, as as you suggested, we see an area that's growing and we want to monitor the the stormwater um, increases, it would be it would be prudent to try to put in a permanent meter in the future. Mr. Bradby, uh, Mr. Irving, and then I also will add in doing research on these proposals, there are I want to call contact technology where it's in you put a meter basically lining the pipe and those may have more maintenance if debris and stuff needs cleaning and then the technology that us cube is proposing is non-contact um, i'm concerned a little bit because they the meters stick over the in uh, in the channel and I, I guess if we ever have to do maintenance we're going to have to take a meter out of out of service, which is not a big deal, but it, it could obstruct us properly maintaining uh, the manholes. So um, it's just something to think about as we move forward that um, maybe we, we start small and then work up to it. Thank you. Mr. Fleck. Mr. Mayor, I move that the City Council award the bid for flow monitoring services uh, to U.S. in the amount of $114,465 for monitoring through the months of December through February. A second. I have a motion with a second. Is there any discussion? Mr. Stanton, Councilor Stanton. Did we uh, get a sense through our conversation with them about why they were able to offer such a uh, a lower cost bid than the other companies. Councilman Stinnett, I, I was very concerned about that and I did take uh, longer due diligence to find out why. Um, basically, I think it's it's the technology that they're using, this non-contact technology. Uh, there's not additional maintenance to go. Uh, the gentleman I spoke to this afternoon said, contact meters they have to go in about once a month uh clean the the bands as i refer to them recalibrate so there's a lot more maintenance um to a, a contact type of flow meter versus a non-contact um uh, we did call the references one um, person that we talked to said he would pay for our study if we weren't pleased with this company. Um, hopefully Mr. Stewart got that in writing for us. <laughs> um, but uh, everyone said this company was in, has been in budget, been very good. Um, the person I talked to today says, you know, their goal is as well as ours being concerned is to get the best accurate information available uh, so we can do forward. So. I do not have a, a great answer, but I try. I was concerned with that differential, and I've done everything possible to check on the firm and make sure we're comparing apples to apples. Thank you. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. I Thank you. Item B is Councilor Subcommittee Appointments for Planning Commission, Historic Preservation Commission, and Urban Forestry Committee Member Interviews. Mr. Mongan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. On December 31st of this year, the Planning Commission, Historic Preservation Commission, and Urban Forestry Committee have member positions that have reached the end of their three-year terms. Uh, the following positions that will need to be filled uh, there will be three on the Planning Commission, one on the Historic Preservation Commission, and two on the Urban Forestry Committee. Uh, the positions were advertised uh, in the Sentinel and on the city's website with the recruitment uh, for applications closing uh, today. Council is being asked to appoint three interview subcommittees to interview applicants applying for the Planning Commission, Historic Preservation Commission, and Urban Forestry Committee. Staff will, will return to the City Council with interview subcommittee recommendations on January 10th of next year. 
um, city uh, recommendation is that city council appoint the three subcommittees to interview the applicants for planning commission, historic preservation, and urban forestry. So on planning commission, anybody, Councilor Fleck? Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I'm, I'm happy to serve on all three, but planning is kind of my passion, so I'd really like to be on that subcommittee. Councilor Roberts on planning. Councilor Thank Herbert. you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, feel free to put me wherever. Okay, I'll put you as the chair on the planning commission. How's that? Okay, Historic Preservation Commission. Um, who wants to be on that one? I'll do that. Councilor Stanley, Councilor Savage. Anyone else? Councilor Fleck. Councilor Savage, you can chair that one. And Urban Forestry Committee member interviews. Councilor Soulsby. Yeah, I, I can you see me, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, you're at the bottom, but yeah. Oh, okay. All right. Yes, I, I would do that. Okay. Anyone else? Councilor Fleck? You want Councilor, Councilor Savage? Councilor Soulsby, you can share that one. Okay. Concerns of Council. Councilor Savage. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I got an email from a constituent who is really concerned about uh, the speed on Kalapuya Way. Um, They're calling it uh, the shortcut and has personally witnessed uh, disturbing amounts of reckless traffic and would like more uh, like speed limit signs put up. I'm wondering if the police could put up their radar machine that um, identifies the speed limit. I've heard great success in, in the reduction of speed and having that be the first point of contact. Is that something that we can do for them? Awesome. Thank you, Chief. Uh, the next step is do we collect data on that so that we can kind of track and see what the speeds are? Awesome. Thank you so much for acknowledging that. And then just kind of follow up if the speeds truly are really high, I'd be interested in looking into potentially putting in more speed limit signs if the data suggests it. Um, thank you. The other thing that I wanted to say is um, what a wonderful event we had a couple of Saturdays ago at Bohemia Park for the Christmas kickoff. I would love to uh, thank John Stennett for donating um, the trees. EBID didn't you, were you a part of That yeah, was downtown Cottage Grove. Say it again? <laughs> downtown Cottage downtown Grove. Downtown Cottage Grove, yes. thank you so much for clarifying. Downtown Cottage Grove for donating the trees. Um, and then the Chamber of Commerce for organizing the event. And then the 40 businesses who got together and decorated the trees. 40 families went home with free Christmas trees that night. And it was just absolutely remarkable and uh, a wonderful event. Um, I also, in, in support of conversations about MUPTI, I know it's coming down the pipeline. We've been talking about it. I'm eager to get to talking about that. I fully support affordable housing. I'm excited to know how we can help do more. Lastly, I just would like to say, Trudy, you're amazing. I know that tonight is your last city council and you are truly, truly appreciated. So thank you. Council Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, first and foremost, uh, Trudy, thank you for the 12 years uh, for this beautiful community. When I was appointed uh, to this council, I was uh, home about a day and a half later and went to myself, what am I getting myself into? Uh, but uh, you helped that adjustment so much. I, I really want to thank you uh, for helping me get through those those first few weeks and days. Because um, there is no handbook for this job. And uh, between uh, all the counselors I have worked with and Trudy, um, it's been working well for us first. Second, I want to thank uh, John Stennett, Downtown Cottage Grove, um, Garden Club. And uh, what was the name of the lady that was helping you? Was she part of your girl? Yeah, Carol Reeves, very flower kind. basket. Yes, very kind lady. Um, for lighting up um, 
All American Square, Opal Park, whatever side of the coin you're on there. Um, it looks absolutely wonderful. Um, yeah, that, that was so much fun doing. Uh, third, uh, the pallet shelters are open as of tonight. Um, I am proud to say that I get to work with Mike Fleck on this program. Got to meet some of uh, the volunteers out there. There were a few little hiccups, but that's uh, you know it's our first start. We made a list of what we need to do. I'm looking forward to working more on this program. Um, as I left after setting up, there was uh, three people already waiting out there to get into one of those warm shelters. So I also want to thank the city for what they do in that program. And I know we're going to be talking more about homelessness coming up here in a little while. So that's great. Um, for 32 years ago, I, I was homeless. And of course, uh, December 22nd of this year is my 30th anniversary of arriving in this town. And uh, just, yeah, love it. Um, and one more thing. I talked to uh, John about this the other day. And I've talked to... Um, Mr. Gilroy and uh, Jake Boone about uh, a way to light up Main Street even more. And if you remember some time ago, we had a log truck come through our historic downtown and uh, pull down one of our light poles. Uh, PP&L replaced that pole with a new wonderful LED light. And it would sure be nice to get uh, all the light poles between 5th Street and 99 changed to those same lights. They really enhance the architecture and the looks of downtown. I think uh, that might bring, you know, this time of year when it gets dark early, I think that might bring more people into our, I think it'll help with economic development by maybe changing those lights. Um, and, uh, that's great. And I have a few things to say about the community center, but I guess I can get into those when we talk about our homelessness. So that's all, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for the time. Councilor Stanek. Just a couple of quick things. Um, Trudy, I'm sorry I missed your uh, bash the other night. Um, you've, you've been a, an immense help to me, uh, both as a newspaper reporter and now as a counselor. Um, I think, you know, going above and beyond the duties to, to help out in a great many ways. Uh, thank you for that. Um, I'd also say it's, it's encouraging and inspiring and, and energizing to see, what is that, 30, 30 odd people uh, joining us virtually, um, as well as several here in the council chambers. I think uh, this town proves that when people get together, then that there's not much that we can't do. And that is very encouraging. I would. Um, encourage each of you to stay involved, uh, to reach out with your perspectives and your concerns. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilor Fleck. Thank you, Ms. Mayor. Um, first of all, I would like to take a moment to recognize Councilor Buck, who's in attendance, and thank her for attending, as well as uh, uh, Chair of the Poverty and Homeless Board, Chris, Chris McAllister. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, and also want to give my kudos to Trudy. Um, in all the years I've been doing this, I've, I've had two city recorders, uh, Joan and Trudy, both excellent and um, will be uh, missed. Um, and so thank you so much for your service. And uh, I'm, I am absolutely certain Mindy is going to do an incredible job as well. And so welcome aboard, Mindy. Um, the, uh, and thank you, Council Roberts, for mentioning the warming shelter. Um, to address some of the concerns, and just for full disclosure, um, my name is Mike Fleck, of course, and I'm Executive Director of Community Sharing Program, who is this year again uh, operating the warming shelter. Um, it is a joint venture between the city and, um, and our agency. Um, and you know, it's funny, the adage that no good deed goes unpunished uh, seems appropriate here because this is not something we do normally. We've done it because the community needed it. Um, and I will say that this year, as with all, uh, we learn as we go and we get much better as we go forward. Um, that being said, uh, because of the stimulus monies that are going on, the county has a huge, huge workload uh, creating contracts. And so if we did miss a day early on, um, and I'm not certain of that because I didn't have a contract in place and so I wasn't actually watching because we could not have it activated because we didn't have a contract in place. And so uh, that was resolved. Um, apparently we have some communication issues uh, that will get resolved immediately as well. So that's on us. I, uh, I, we will definitely be more diligent and work on that in the future. Um, and I think that's actually all I have. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I want to encourage the folks that have brought the climate concerns to our uh, city. Um, 
I guess I'd just like to say that I certainly do support uh, the things that we can do within our means. Um, you know, uh, I'm not sure that declaring an emergency is uh, really the way to go. Um, certainly not against, but uh, I think action is uh, uh, speaks louder than than you know words, so to speak. So. Um, I, I hope to look forward to more discussion around what is it that our little city can do in this massive problem of, of climate change. So anyway, thank you. Councilor Irvin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I want to give a report uh, from the Lane Economic Committee meeting. Uh, we had a couple uh, informational presentations. First, from the Early Learning Hub, uh, discussing the shortage in early childhood uh, care uh, in Lane County and giving some comparisons between uh, the, the state on a national level. And um, one of the statistics that kind of stood out uh, was that for every available open spot, um, loosely defined from zero to five years old available, uh, places that are credentialed, either uh, in-home credentialed or facility levels, but for every person uh, looking, or for every spot that was already filled, there were seven, uh, seven children kind of on the waiting list or that can't be filled. So uh, they're just highlighting that as a uh, primary or a, a very important factor uh, in considering uh, economic development, early childhood education. Uh, and child care. Um, so that was uh, one of the informative uh, pieces and there's information if anybody's interested, I can forward on that presentation. Um, also, uh, Lane Workforce Partnership um, is uh, looking, uh, was looking for support. They're gonna be standing up a program that uh, basically connects our industries. Uh, one of the examples would be in truck drivers, uh, whether it be for uh, manufacturing uh, uh, equipment, um, log truck drivers, uh, and the training uh, involved in that to support the industry uh, that are local to us here uh, in Lane County. Um, they, there's a very high demand uh, that is not being met. Even some of the local schools uh, that do truck driving certifications, uh, I'm thinking the one on I-5 that you can see, um, is is incapable in, in their current um, capacity to to meet that demand. So um, working to, to recognize where there's high demand and to meet that. So uh, that, that is something that uh, I think we can uh, collaborate with. I know there's a lot of stakeholders uh, here, uh, so just a, information on that. Uh, I wanted to address uh, the MUPTI. Uh, I know that we're going to be talking about that, give a little back history on kind of why we're we, where we are and uh, kind of the openness for, for change uh, down the road, uh, kind of taking into assessment uh, what we're learning. I'm really glad to hear that we're going to have uh, an assessment done on the, the effects of uh, the MUPTI that we put in place. Um, in those initial meetings when we passed the MUPTI, I remember advocating to open the gates as wide as possible uh, for new housing to come in and to attract. Um, we were dealing with just an absolute uh, desert in available housing. We still are, uh, as will be evidenced by some of the testimony, uh, perhaps even in the our future agenda items in this meeting. Um, that being said, the intent was always to uh, look at the goal, look at where we were aiming, look at, uh, I think it was based on the housing needs analysis, where are we tracking with meeting that need and being open, ready, willing uh, to turn the dials, um, uh, taking into consideration uh, you know, the de desirability of living here, you know, what effect, tra you know, traffic concern, all all things considered uh, and whether or not they're meeting the the needs uh, of our community. So all that to, to say, looking forward to taking into consideration the data and, and adjusting as needed. Uh, let me save a big portion of that for later and then I guess to address the climate change uh, as well, 
I am open to hear arguments uh, and and data. At this time, I am not in support of declaring a, a climate emergency. Um, and I'd say feel free to to reach out and I'm all all ears to hear the the arguments. Um, I am interested to hear what contract we signed uh, as a city and what effect that has and when that's going to be implemented and what's involved in that uh, pertaining to carbon tracking. And Trudy, you're going to be missed. Welcome, Mindy. Councilor Soulsby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just wanted to say that we had to miss the um, Cottage Grove Christmas celebration this year, the first time in, since I moved back home. And uh, I was very sad to miss it. I had great feedback. Uh, good job, uh, everyone who was involved in that. And Trudy, congratulations on your new adventure and getting to spend more time with the grandkids and your children and i'm sure you're looking forward to that and mindy welcome aboard yeah and i, I just want to say um you know i was telling trudy that before the meeting tonight that we were both at our first city council meeting together and this is her last one here so um i'm glad i got to be with her first and last for her and you are going to be missed. I really enjoy our conversations and Mindy, welcome on board. And I want to thank Commissioner Buck. I invited her to be here tonight because of item 9B. Um, she has, her whole adult career has been low income housing. So I'm hoping that we can get some support from the county moving forward because I know we're going to need it. So thank you for attending. And I know you had a busy night tonight. So with that, we will move into item nine, business from the city manager. First item is opioid litigation settlement, Mr. Boone. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So several months ago, um, parties in some litigation against opioid manufacturers and distributors um, reached a settlement. And that settlement uh, includes us in a, well, could include us, I should say. Um, this was, uh, the idea was a, a number of states, counties, municipalities came together and, and sued um, Johnson & Johnson and Janssen, which is the subsidiary, I believe, of Johnson & Johnson that has done manufacturing of a lot of opioids, and then three uh, distributors of those opioids, um, McKesson, Amerisource, Bergen, and Cardinal Health. So, the, the four defendants apparently decided to settle. Um, that settlement is in the billions of dollars, which sounds very exciting for us, but don't get your hopes up too much because by the end of this, I will explain why it's likely to be an underwhelming experience for us. Um, but the settlement this, that, they, that they reached is somewhat unique in that uh, most class action suits of this sort are opt-out. So you're automatically considered in unless you tell them, no, 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 I want to uh, maintain my ability to sue these companies myself instead of signing on to this lawsuit that's already happening. Uh, this one's reversed. So we're out unless we say, yes, we would like to be in. Now the I guess the downside of opting in is that then we are giving up our ability to sue Johnson & Johnson, McKesson, Amerisource, Bergen, and Cardinal Health over um, our damages through, you know, that we've encountered in the opioid crisis. Um, we do not recommend that we try to sue any of those companies as it is very likely that every single one of them has a legal budget that dwarfs our entire city budget every year. Um, and we probably wouldn't get anywhere. So it seems more reasonable to sign on with this one to get our chunk of this settlement and uh, move forward from there. Now, this settlement also requires uh, what they're calling a critical mass of states and local governments to opt in over a six month period that started quite some time ago and ends January 2nd. Um, the number of government entities that sign on increases the total amount of money that's getting paid out. So even if we don't stand to get much, just the fact that we sign on helps other municipalities, counties, and states 
get more than they would if we didn't sign on. Um, so the, the defendants have the ability to kind of walk away if they're not satisfied with the settlement and maybe move forward to trial or whatever. And the plaintiffs, the, the various states and, and other localities that have been involved with this also have the option to walk away if they're not happy. So there's still a little bit of wrangling going on, particularly at the state level. Um, the state of Oregon and a number of cities that were in fact participants in this lawsuit going forward, so they're the ones that you know, footed the bill for the, the attorneys and that sort of thing, are still kind of working out some of the, the details as to how that money gets distributed among uh, the, the counties and the cities of the state like ours. So all the answers aren't quite in yet, but we know that whatever the answers end up being, we're going to have to sign on by January 2nd if we want to have any part of it. And as you all know, this is the last city council meeting of the year, and unless y'all would like us to call you together on, say, New Year's Day to decide this particular question, um, our suggestion is um, that you authorize the city manager to, to approve the participation in both the, the national settlement and the Oregon settlement, uh, the settlement agreement as to how it gets split out, and authorize the city manager to sign all of those documents once they are finalized and distributed so that we don't have to you know, pull you in during the holidays to do that. And I can answer a few questions, but there's still a lot in the air. Uh, Councilor Fleck? So just a quick question. Um, I know it has a cost, no cost to the city, what in the event that negotiations fail and they end up going to court, uh, I guess that without seeing the agreement, I'm assuming that there would not be any financial burden on us, say they decided to try to seek some of the legal costs since we signed off. The, any legal costs that would be incurred would come out of our share of the settlement. So there would, there would not be a, at least as far as I know, there's no foreseeable way in which we would be left writing somebody else a check over this. We, we might end up, you know, if, if enough uh, of the legal fees come out of the settlement, we could end up getting nothing. But we certainly wouldn't end up having to pay somebody something. Okay. Well, with that, I'll move that the... Um uh city council authorize the city manager to sign uh both of those settlement participant agreements second i have a motion with a second is there any discussion if i may mr mayor go ahead um our city attorney wanted to be very clear that um the city council approves the city's participation in both of those agreements as well as authorizing the city manager to sign I will adjust my motion to reflect that. So seconded. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The item 9B, homelessness discussion. Mr. Myers. Um, I can read through all this if you'd like, but I won't. Um, I do want to point out that we did receive a couple letters and they're attached. And for those of you at the desk, you received a copy, I believe, of the letter from Bruce Kelsch and the letter from Be Your Best. And for those that are online, they're attached to the attachments on the agenda item um, regarding uh, the homeless discussion. Um, also, we're not going to be making any decisions tonight. I mean, this is this is the first discussion and kind of looking at general policies, general direction of what we need to do and what we want to do um, for this issue in our community. Um, we are affected by statutes and case law that have um, come down and have required municipalities now, especially in the Ninth Circuit Court jurisdiction, to handle homelessness a certain way. Other portions of the country are not there yet. Um, that has not applied to them, um, and there will be more than likely other court cases in those areas to bring things um, similarly together. Um, our current situation, um, 
we have homeless. Um, it's anywhere from 20 um, some people to over 40 people a night. Um, the McKinney Vento program um, with the school district is uh, in 19 in the year school year 1920, 19, 2019, 2020. School year had a total of 260 kindergarten through 12th grade students that were considered homeless. Um, we have a number of families that are homeless, and especially in our Guatemalan population, where if they're multi-family units in a building, they are considered homeless because they don't have their own home. They're, they're double, triple bunking families in, in facilities because there isn't housing. Um, as a result of Martin versus Boise, and, and kind of go over that a little bit, we gave you the whole case plus the amended order and um, basically they they went back and said hey we want to talk about it some more the court upheld what they did before it has been through the supreme court and it's to them and they said no we're not going to touch it so that meant the decision of the ninth circuit stand um, and basically that decision on page 39 of the report you have is that an ordinance violates the eighth amendment insofar that it imposes a criminal sanction against homeless individuals for sleeping outdoors on public property when no alternative shelter is available, available to them. Um, as a result of that, that is why we have shelters at the community center, um, trying to put them in a place where we can do some connection and have some control over what's going on and make some of those connections that are needed to be able to try to resolve some of the issues that have created the homeless uh, homelessness for those individuals. Um, if we just didn't do anything, they'd be all over and we wouldn't have that connection. We wouldn't have that ability to start bringing some services to them. We have Carry It Forward. Howard from Carry It Forward has been meeting on somewhat of a regular basis, coming by with Teresa and helping make connections. We have one individual there who um, essentially came to the community center, um, started staying, didn't have any ID, had no identification, a common problem for homeless um, that was made him ineligible to find a job and get a job because he didn't have his ID. Our staff took him, got his ID, um, and got him the ID. He now has a job, and he's excited that he has a job and was excited that now he's going to be able to get an apartment. Well, it's still he still cannot get an apartment. There aren't any, um, and he's on the list to try to get him into some kind of housing, but there isn't anything for him. He is working. And, and doing a great job working. In fact, the family that hired him it had him come to their house for Thanksgiving. So things are moving there. We have another individual who is the result of a motor vehicle accident and um, is trying to get the settlement taken care of. He can barely walk. Um, severe injuries from that. He does not know how to move through the settlement process and get that resolved so he can get his, his settlement. So we're helping and trying to make connections for him and get those things moving. Those are the kind of individual actions that make the homeless um, homelessness situation very complex and difficult to handle. Um, there is no one magic solution that fits all situations. Each individual brings with them individual characteristics that make each solution individual. Um, and, and quite frankly, that's probably the reason why the federal and state governments are not get a handle around this. They can throw money at it, but they just can't figure out a way to solve it because they don't work on an individual basis very well. Um, and so it's been pushed down to the, the local level, to the county and state level, to the county and city levels. Um, we can do individual stuff for the better sometimes. Um, two of the laws that are in place now, House Bill 3115 basically puts into statute um, the provisions of um, the Martin versus Boise case. Um, and that'll go into effect in 2023, in July 1st, 2023. It also provides the provisions that it's a defense. It, if they're pushed from a site, that it's automatically a defense for them to be able to um, seek assistance or seek um, restitution or re reimbursement for expenses or challenges associated with somebody enforcing the rules or laws that, that are unconstitutional. Um, the Boise case is in effect now, and it is law. Uh, House Bill 20, 3124 basically describes and creates some conditions associated with campsites. 
any camping facility or campsite or camper that is there for 72 hours or more becomes a campsite. And as a result, they have rights associated with the protection of their personal property um, and notice requirements that have been removed and moved on, as well as maintenance or the protection of their property for a period of 30 days after they've moved off the site so that we have to keep it safe so it won't be stolen um, or damaged or lost. So those are some additional laws that have gone into place in Oregon. There's a whole variety of issues associated with how people get homeless, and it's not always the same. There is no one stereotypical answer for who a homeless person is. And that's one of the things I think that is most important for us to understand and realize that when we're dealing with homeless, it's not all drug addicts. It's not all people that have decided. There are a variety of people ranging everywhere from domestic violence to injuries to tragic mental or uh, tragic mental illness or tragic health issues that put them out of their homes. 59% of the citizens in the United States are less than a paycheck away from being homeless. Um, that's pretty astounding um, that there are so many people in this country that are that close to being homeless. And once you're there, the ability to get back out of that becomes harder and harder the longer they're in that position. Our current status, as you know, I've told you the, the numbers that the school district has, the 260 youth, um, our pit count for the county in 2019 was 4,115. One of the problems with um, us having some data about how many is we don't have anything that's really connecting with all of them. Community sharing has some numbers as a result of the number of people they serve, but it's it still doesn't catch everything. And the only way to try to do that is actually having some kind of program or activities or function that starts addressing them and getting stabilized housing in their place. Um, our current response is, um, number one, we do not enforce our lodging and vehicles. Um, this is another piece of the um, Martin versus Boise case as well. Um, if somebody sleeps in their car or a motorhome or a camp trailer on the street, um, as long as they're not there for more than 72 hours, we will not um, cite them even though we have that on our books, um, we will not cite them for lodging and vehicle. It's, um, they're protected by that, by the Martin versus Boise case now. But they do have to move the residual dollars um, because that affects all parking. Um, we are, we do enforce our parking lots. Um, that some of the parking lots do close in the parks, so they can't park there overnight, but they can park on city streets. Um, with our community center and city hall space that is being used for campers right now um, we've kept people from taking over and camping in the parks um, in the past we've done some rather serious cleanup issues and, and efforts um, especially under the main street bridge uh, the last cleanup i believe it was close to fifty thousand dollars where we had to hire an actual firm to come in and remove um, waste material uh, free stuff furniture everything from underneath the bridge um, it is expensive to take care of the cleanups. And so in trying to run something and do something and provide some service, um, we're saving those costs and preventing that from happening throughout our parks and other locations. Um, we have a wide range of options as we look at what we need to do. Um, we've also been meeting with uh, stakeholders I formed back in 2018, I believe, a, a community stakeholders group, which is comprised of uh, the local organizations that were addressing mental health, um, housing, uh, community sharing, South Wing Wheels, South Wing Mental Health, the Peace Health, the school district, um, the county. Um, there, there were many more on that list. Uh, Vets for Freezing Nights, Square One Villages, um, the, the list goes on quite large of people that family relief nursery, all of these that were had some way in some contact associated with homelessness or mental illness, mental illness issues. We've been meeting and talking and we coordinated efforts and we're trying to put things together um, through that group. Um, the Chamber of Commerce is now on that group as well. Um, and we've been trying to coordinate what we can do and how we can address some of those issues. Just Friday afternoon, um, I have the opportunity to um, meet with 
Dan Bryant from Square One again, and also with some representatives from um, Carry It Forward. Uh, Square One villages, they're the ones who kind of are the parents over um, Cottage Village Coalition and help them build their tiny homes, has contracted and doing some contracts with uh, Carry It Forward, where Carry It Forward is doing some of their other um, homeless services and functions for them. We are also working with Carry It Forward on our site here, where we are um, having Howard and Carry It Forward come down and we try to piece some some services together as much as we can with some of the individuals that are there. Uh, took them around, showed them city properties, showed them our site there at the community center, um, talked about other options and issues and, and some of the thoughts that the stakeholders group and the staff has thought of in looking at how we can do better and what can we do that will actually move us into a position where we are starting to get people into those positions that they can take care of themselves and move back into some kind of traditional housing, um, whether that's a transitional housing model um, or into a tiny home or into regular traditional um, house of some kind of apartment or house. Um, as a result of that, they are excited to work with us and have expressed a really strong desire to work with us. Um, a lot of the options that we've looked at and I've presented in your in your long memo, um, <laughs> it was a full range. Um, quite frankly, we can do nothing if you want to. Um, basically, we can say we're going to do nothing and we're going to take down the shelters of the community center and the homeless individuals in this community can camp anywhere on public property that they wish. Um, I think that would be, um, number one, a little bit um, deep in, inhuman to the individuals that are camping. Um, and I think it would also be something that the citizens of the community would not like to see um, that having campsites wherever and whenever they pop up in the community and not have the ability to do anything about it. Um, we need to do some kind of controlled approach to address the specifics of the Martin versus Boise case. We need some alternatives so that we can set some time, night, place, and manner issues associated with how other properties can be used. Um, what I have recommended, and um, in kind of in a just a general sense, is we would like to move forward with trying to close down the campsite at the community center. But in order to do that, we need another site. We need some other facility that would house homeless individuals. We currently have the warming shelter. It's open tonight, um, and that's great. Probably open tomorrow night as well. Um, and I think it's already given notice that it's open tomorrow night. Um, and that's great for those cold nights, but we need something that's going to be providing that shelter for them, for those individuals, um, on a more regular basis, every night, and even during the day. Um, a dusk to dawn facility is an option. It's a cheaper option than doing a full 24-7 facility, but you lose the opportunity to be able to provide some services and to provide those connections. The individuals come in at dawn, at dusk, sleep and leave in the dawn. You don't have a chance to be able to connect them to some of the wraparound services, get them connected to uh, organizations that can help them get their ID or get some job trainings or get some opportunities or take care of mental health, health issues. Um, a full 24 seven facility would be able to do that. Um, Harriet Forward has expressed a desire or interest in doing that with us. Um, we did look at some properties. And I guess I will get specific that um, we need to think about and consider. Um, one is the property we're trying to buy. We haven't bought it yet. It's still hanging around out there. It hasn't closed. Um, but that's a little more long term. And I would like to suggest that we look at that property as a transitional housing facility. That would be one kind of like a tiny home project, but would be tinier homes. They're, they're basically dorm rooms with a, a centralized kitchen and restaurant facility. Um, to save costs and to keep it cheap. Um, they would be charged rent. They would be self-governed, much like the Tiny Homes Project or the Opportunity Village in Eugene and actually be able to provide a place where people can transition from homelessness into more traditional housing. But what we need is something for those, those homeless to get in that first step as well. Um, we have a piece of property on the south of the town, I think, um, that we purchased to fix 
art. Um, that site is actually a pretty good site if you need a homeless camp or a facility. Homeless camp is a cheap, easy, a bad way to say it, but a 24-7 facility that would provide them services, provide them connections to showers, which are in the house, you know, kitchen facilities that are there. They'd have those connections and be able to make those connections to the services that they need um, and have a place to start giving back in the world. When we look at other models around the community, around this country that have been successful, the biggest and first thing that has to happen is we have to stabilize the housing. Um, that site has enough space. Um, we can set it up and, and be up and running probably in a month or two um, if we push. Um, but it would be a location that could be easily done. Um, we can do other issues or other things as well um, that might have other ways to help lessen the burden on the city as well as, as um, providing those services. Um, Eugene Springfield um, have, for example, and other communities have adopted it as well, and an overnight camping um, ordinance that allows residents, businesses, private property owners to have um, space on their property where they can have a tent in the backyard and somebody family can live in the backyard. They have to provide certain services. You have to provide a way for them to have sanitation, garbage service, and things like that. Or they can have somebody stay in an RV. Currently, you can't do that under our city ordinances for a long period of time. These would provide opportunities for churches, businesses, individuals to help with this situation um, and still provide some connection as well uh, and so it's a, a viable opportunity springfield has done it and they've targeted primarily towards the individuals that were affected by the river fire, fires and been successful eugene is doing it and you see a number of churches that have an rv in their parking lot or um, a, a tiny home on wheels built and put in their parking lot and and they're doing this and it helps relieve some of the burden on us and other agencies to try to take care of that some of the other things you may want to think about is if we have a facility, um, we can then adopt other ordinances that regulate and restrict um, camping or other things that happen in the public right of way. Um, we have our ordinance that restricts public right of way to be used to pass things from people to vehicle, people to the hazard, safety issues that are associated there. Um, we can do the same thing there and make sure that we don't end up with um, campsites set up on on parking strips or on sidewalks or in the right of way even so that we keep people safe and prevent that from happening. That wouldn't apply to legally parked vehicles, but it would apply to other kinds of things. Um, and then we'd have to um, as well look at how we will prioritize our parks or other property, city property if our facility, whatever we provide, is full. I mean, once it fills up, other public property set priorities. Coos Bay and North Bend have ordinance that sets priorities of when these things are full, these are the next places. And that's kind of what we've done already, but we just have it in a draft policy of when the community center is full, the, the west side of the city hall is available. Uh, if that's full, then we're kind of, hey, we don't know where to go. It'll probably be some other park location. Um, but we can set that kind of priority as well. That's it in a nutshell. There's a whole lot of reading material here that I, I gave the council and I'm kind of open for discussion and what direction, what kind of general guidelines are we moving in the right way? Are you interested in what we're trying to think about doing? If so, we will continue to move forward. And as we bring those items, we can, they'll be coming back to the council. Um, any steps in making uh, the properties available, uh, the, 19, the 99 property, um, in doing that, we will be bringing that back to the council. Because number one, you're going to have to sell it to yourself. Um, right now, the street fund's on it, and the street fund cannot pay for the homeless shelter. So we'd have to buy it, put it in the general fund, fund the street fund, um, and we'd buy, be buying that with ARP money. Um, the ARP money is our opportunity right now to actually do something and spend the capital fund right away and get the capital and the infrastructure in place. Um, we have been visiting with the county. Thank you, Commissioner Buck, for being here as well. But we've been visiting with Maria, uh, Maria Cortez with the county and talking about what kind of financing opportunities, what kind of fundings are available from the county to help us as well as we look at continued operation um, or current operations. If we do create a 24-7 um, facility, 
the warming shelters will close. I mean, we won't need the warming shelters anymore because we would have a place where they go all the time. Um, so what we would probably do is take the shelters with the warming shelter and feed them in a 24 seven facility um, and continue to operate it that way. Um, I think I've said enough in the pleasant front course. So questions, comments, discussion? Before, before I open it up to council, uh, Ms. Rob Dickinson signed up to speak on this, so I'm gonna let him have this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I am Rob Dickinson, and I am here speaking on this topic as a participant in the Be Your Best group. I'm glad that you received the letter from Be Your Best. I think it's a, Be Your Best is a collection of around 40 different organizations working to make the Cottage Grove and South Lane better. Um, this letter, um, if you haven't had a chance to look at it, encourage the city to um, do more in terms of um, creating shelter and housing, and in particular to allocate some of the American Rescue Plan funding towards those important goals. Some of the items in the letter um, is expressing the support of the participants in Be Your Best member organizations for the warming shelter in particular, that's an important thing, for moving forward with um, some sort of transitional housing, a housing first model is the right way to stabilize people lives and uh, having a way to have wraparound services that really can help people get out of um, uh, homelessness. Um, and then also looking for ways of building more affordable low-income housing, which is critically needed in our community. We have a 1% vacancy rate um, for rentals, and that's uh, basically quite, quite difficult. Um, there are things we could do, like having, uh, in addition to the monthly program we have, something like low-income uh, reduced property tax exemption that could also encourage affordable housing development. As someone who um, served for many years on a housing committee and a housing and human service committee prior to moving here, I can tell you I do recognize what the city manager talked about, the complexity of this problem and how the, the homeless really do suffer from many overlapping challenges that make it really hard to get out of homelessness. As a board member with South Lake Mental Health, I can tell you that our board unanimously voted at our last meeting to sign on to this letter as a recognition that many of our clients do struggle with a lack of housing that they can afford and qualify for. Also, as um, the person who has answered the phones for the Cottage Grove Mutual Aid Helpline for the last 19 months, um, um, I can tell you that our in-house population really does need additional support and uh, shelter. Um, as part of Cottage Grove Community Cares, we have provided emergency shelter for at least 50 individuals for probably close to 200 motel nights. I have answered pretty much every one of those calls and spoke to those individuals, and I know what the challenges they are that they face. Many of the people that called were seniors, were veterans, were people with disabilities, often all of those. Um, they were people suffering from mental illness, people coming, um, leaving situations of domestic violence. There are many people with significant health challenges, like uh, individuals with cancer who are out there sleeping in the cars in the damp, and, where their health condition means um, that makes it even all the worse. Um, so I, I would just really encourage you to look at the, the broad range of options that we could do and, uh, and hopefully move forward, knowing that um, we are a, a community that wants to come together and work on things and that we have a lot of these organizations wanting to be there with you. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I failed to mention, I do want to mention that uh, we're working in closely with the home share program, the Oregon home share. You've probably seen that we put it in the Friday update, doing some things with them. Um, encouraging people to also look at that share program and pair up with people who can address the homeless that way um, and, and find ways to solve that there. Uh, so we will be having um, the Judy, I can't remember her last name now, um, but coming to a future council meeting, we'll talk a little bit more about the home share program to share that with you so that you can understand that that program. I want to give you a good example of the gentleman that's outside my window at, uh, here at City Hall. Um, Elderly gentleman, 70 some years old, uh, can barely stand up straight, uh, clean, uh, takes care of his stuff, uh, but he's on social security and he doesn't have enough money for the post store. He can't. He has money and he wants to buy a van. Um, so if anybody has a van, he is looking for a van to live in. Um, and, but he has those funds, but there is nothing for him. That's the kind of situation for the community that wants to uh, yeah, the opportunities aren't there to help them. 
but who wants to go first? Councilor Roberts. So, what can we and can we not talk about in this particular? You can talk about anything. I think you just okay, can't make I'm, it. I'm just checking. I, I've gotten in trouble before. I don't. Uh, well, I mean, I would very much hopefully be able for this community to find a spot where we can basically put all our eggs in one basket. I think that would be the best thing to try to remedy the problem of homelessness. Um, currently for me, and uh, yesterday after I was done helping downtown Cottage go for lights up, I had a meeting with uh, several homeowners that live behind the community center. Uh, especially one that's right there off of a loading dock. And listening to the complaints of what's going on, uh, I know we're doing the best we can with what that. Uh, I'd, I'd like to be able to, hopefully we can work on something to get the, that those people move to a different spot. Because we're also getting ready, I believe, to open up the library full time. Right. And I just think that I've had some parents tell me they're not letting their kids down there because of that. Um, so we did, hopefully we can work together and find a spot to move. If not, you know, do the best we can with what we have. Um, my other question is, is the webinar tomorrow, will that be recorded? I have to... Yes, it so is. Will I, there be a way for me to watch that later? Yes, and um, actually, if any of you want to, the, the League did open their resource page today. So the link is available on the, the, the LOC's webpage. Um, and there's some actually some pretty good resources there um, that you can pull on and look at. Um, a lot of the information is going to be what you've got in your packet already, right. um, but it's they've got a lot of resources there. Um, so yeah, the webinar I believe is going to be available and have it recorded on the website so people get to watch it other time. Our staff is going to be watching it tomorrow together in here um, and interacting with it hopefully and finding out more. Um, but in my perusal of the information on their website, what you've got, what you've heard is what they're going to say. I mean, it's it's pretty much, hey, you, there are some options, and you can craft it to fit your community, and you need to craft it to fit the individuals. Um, and that's that's where we, we want to look at. One of the problems we're having with the community center is our staff is there Monday through Friday from 8 to 5. And there's nobody there in the evenings, and there's nobody there. Please go by and check occasionally and, and verify that things are okay. But um, other people show up, other things happen. Um, we've got everything from individuals in the community that are probably housed individuals um, pull up with their truck and, and back into the tent area and, and gas some of the, the residents with the exhaust in their vehicles. Or they'll pull in straight in and flash their lights on. And on. We've had other community event uh, members that have shown up with soup and foods blankets and tried to help um, and so it's I mean it's that's what's happening there um, more than likely the staff that the people that we have at the community center and I've heard this from property owners or residents in the area that oh it's terrible they're stealing stuff out of my yard well I'm sorry gentleman living next to my window the gentleman that was hit with the car uh, the truck and barely walked the other person who's got diabetes and hardly breathe and the other kids at work those people aren't speaking uh, And to uh, lump in a stereotypical, hey, they're all drug dealers and they're all stealing, when, quite frankly, that neighborhood has other problems as well. Okay. And so it's, it's how, do we, how do we address those? How do we pull them in with supervision? I mean, they need supervision and help getting back into how to act properly and how to help them solve some of their problems. If they're insurmountable problems, and as they get those problems, and they continue to have those problems, I mean, we have one individual at the community center who has, has PTSD worse than anything. He saw his sister commit suicide with a gun to her head when he was 17 years old. His brother died this last year, and his dad has told him, hey, why don't you go kill him? That's what he's living with. And he's homeless. And how can he get anywhere with that kind of burden. We need to do something to help them move into the roles that they can properly do. Now we've had a, a at the community center, we picked two people off. Um, they've been excluded. One we actually hauled to the county jail. Um, she should have never been released from the mental institution that she was in. Um, but because of 
funding problems with the state on some of those more tragic and chronic cases, um, we will continue to see those. But that's what we need the supervision for, is to make sure that those individuals get somewhere else or are excluded from damaging the ability of others to have this system back in the real life. So one other person we did have to exclude him as well. Now, under Martin versus Boise, Martin versus Boise and the state law, we can exclude them from the community center, but they can go camp somewhere else on public property. Until we put something else. Until we get something there, and then we can exclude them there. So, and then, you know, they can be excluded from a facility that we create and everything, that they can go somewhere else under the law. We just have to keep chasing them around until we get them into some kind of state where we can scenario. I am understanding of the situation there with what we have. What I'm saying is, uh, until we can find the right way to deal with this elsewhere from the community side, I noticed in your wonderful write up that you had talked about maybe getting that area of the loading dock off limits somehow. Right. Currently, uh, that would be great. I mean, I, I feel for these taxpayers that have bought that home, uh, four or five years ago, they said, which was uh, one of those homes here in town that was in really bad shape. They have sunk almost $100,000 into that home and to the point that they can't use their backyard. It's right there off the loading dock. So I'm just saying, if we can do, you know, right. I understand we got to be able to make every, it's hard to make everybody happy here and to be able to keep the program moving forward. Um, so I just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, we you know could. Me, I lived that life for two years until I woke up, smelled the coffee and changed my life around. And uh, I'd like to be able to see other people be able to make the same decisions I did that changed their lives. So, um, but yet, yeah. Yeah, one of the options that we're looking at as well is taking the community center site, essentially vacating it, telling everyone to leave for the day and securing their properties and, and stuff and making sure they're secure and then remove the tents and set up a 20 by 40 canopy and then divide it into eight yes. sections and put our own tents in there and they can come back, be in those tents they can't have anything outside other than the bike, a chair, and their locker box, um, and no tarps and set some new rules, and then that would prevent us to have the space on the road without being needed anymore. Well, it might be, but we put that off. But that's that's one of the other options, but it still doesn't get rid of the, the problem that, hey, after five o'clock, nobody's there. On weekends, nobody's there. Um, we end up with other people coming, and then we have other issues to associate with that and try to get things straight back up the next week. So, like I say, I, I applaud what the city staff and uh, Public Works, the work, the time and effort they put into and community sharing with what they've done so far with this problem. I mean, as this town to me, as this town grows and uh, the current pandemic and other economic factors, inflation and that, we're going to be seeing more and more of this. So I think getting some type of plan together, and I see we're working towards that. Um, for the future is huge. I just want to thank you for the time you do put in for this. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your time, Mr. Moore. Councilor Soulsby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I, I truly believe that we do need to pay attention to what our citizens are also telling us because we don't just have the responsibility to the homeless situation. We also have the responsibility to take care of our citizens that pay for you know, they're paying their taxes and, and just to say, oh, I'm sorry, this, you know, like, like I just heard. And I'm, I'm curious to know why our attorney is not present tonight, because I would have some questions for her on this. I, I read over the Martin versus Boise, and I'm not an attorney, but I also read a bunch of articles, and these are not my words, but this is one article that I did read. And it said in this article, although it has been argued that the Martin case leaves local governments powerless to do anything about homeless encampments, unless there is adequate shelter space or public housing available for all people living unhoused, multiple courts have held that Martin's case does not preclude local government from cleaning encampments as long as people are not arrested. And so I would just like to know exactly what the laws truly are and not like some word scramble because I feel like 
we need to make right decisions here and we have one shot at this. And um, I also wanted to thank uh, Bruce Kelsch for sending us that email. And he did state, um, he listed that one of the best states right now is Utah for the homeless situation that they brought down their homeless by 74%. But I actually went and looked at their legislative audit as of November 16, 2021. And they actually, although they have a lower per capita homeless, they're having some serious problems because their homeless spending is up by 600% and their homeless situation still keeps rising. And so I, what I don't want to see our city do is make some of the mistakes that we see in other locations right now, is in San Francisco, Seattle, Portland, and I know that we're a lot smaller, but as I've stated before, I worry because our services, our ambulance, you know, every time that ambulance goes out for situations and the incidences are a lot higher with um, communities that grow like this and we're seeing it grow right now. And just as the city manager just stated, you know, when we run out of space at the community center, it'll be behind the city hall. And, and I'm very concerned that we're growing this as an issue. And I, and I also want to know if we really truly have to build shelters, if that is law or if it is just being sold to us that way. Because we do have many shelters that are 20 minutes away in Eugene Springfield with a lot of services up there. And if these people truly are not citizens of Cottage Grove, and we're getting people coming through that transient moving to the next town and they're just going to camp here. Also, um, I heard um, uh, that, um, Richard, I just heard you say that um, we're, we're, we're more restricted here in Oregon and than other parts of the country. And I'm curious to know why that is, if that's a state issue. And if that truly is the case, I'm curious because when I was driving home the other night on I-5, there was a sign right where that homeless encampment was right off the exit there that said there's um, no camping allowed. And so does the state have special, I mean, if we have to make accommodations, why isn't the state? And then also, um, Mr. Myers, a question is, um, you said that you're not allowing them to camp in parking lots, but they can camp on our city streets. And I, I'm curious to know what the laws are there um, and why, what's, what's the difference in that? And I don't want to come across like I'm not feeling for this situation. I truly am, but I don't want to grow our problem. And then the other problem I have with the transitional housing is that we're going to expect our taxpayers to fund it as far as pay salaries. And I'm not sure that all our taxpayers would be on board for a forever thing to paying salaries. And then one more issue I'd like to point out with the Utah um, transitional housing. They said that 30% of the people living in that transitional housing had been there for 10 years or more. And so it's not exactly transitional housing. And if we were to go along those lines, I think that there, there would definitely need to be parameters. And then also one more thing, with transitional housing, if we're talking about doing some tiny homes, when they're all full, then we can't put these people up anymore anyway. And so how does that affect Martin versus Boise? Those are just all my two cents, thank you. If you want to respond or do you want me to go to Councilor Fleck? You can go to Councilor Fleck. Councilor Fleck. Well, thank you. And I guess, you know, first of all, I, I really want to recognize what Councilor Sol Solsby's, you know, concerns are. Um, you know, I think all of us who've driven through some of those larger communities um, have some real concerns. And I think, I think that's a valid, you know, concern to address. Um, you know, that said, I, I've also, you know, our agency isn't directly involved in what the county is. And so I would say 
we really need to be working with the county. There are local community action agencies, so federal and state dollars flow through them out to the providers. Um, and, and if you guys were to look at all of the programs that they're doing, I think you guys would see that there is really many, many approaches because like Richard had mentioned, every one of the unhoused folks I know have different sets of, of needs and, and concerns. Um, I will say the state has completely abandoned us and that the state hospital system absolutely is ridiculous. In fact, I was told from somebody from what used to be called the Johnson unit that, um, you know, basically unless somebody is, is uh, convicted criminally of, of violent crimes that, that, you know, getting into one of those beds is just about zero. And yet I know of at least a couple of our unhoused in town that really literally um, are so mentally ill that they are not going to be stable in any sort of environment other than that, at least, you know, short term. Um, <clears throat> you also have folks, um, in fact, I will say a couple of those have been in uh, permanent supportive housing, but lost it because they became violent. And so um, this is not a simple discussion, and I hope that we can expand this and not get frustrated, you know, and try to take an approach that makes the most sense. I think we need to partner with the county. Um, as I mentioned before, we have Heather Buck here, um, it, you know, and we also have Chris McAllister. So the Poverty, Poverty and Homelessness Board is a subcommittee of the county that, or it's a committee of the county that um, discusses all of these issues in detail, and we are um, required under HUD to have these, uh, these programs um, with this committee. And so I think that by joining with them and doing what pieces we can to support uh, the overall mission is really gonna be the only way to success. Um, because we do, we need everything from permanent um, supportive housing, we need rapid rehousing, we need transitional housing. Um, and, and this is a very complex discussion that I don't want to try to do now because like I said, this is not a simple solution. Um, I will say though that we have a pot of money now and an opportunity to put in, um, you know, some sort of project from the capital sense of it. Um, and to address Councillor Soulsby's concerns, the county does have, albeit somewhat limited, uh, funds for the operations of these programs. Um, I think Square One Village has done a great job with uh, both the tiny homes and the Opportunity Village. I think that's a great first start uh, where it's a self-governed group of folks. Uh, once again, those folks who cannot get along in that environment still are going to need some sort of solution, which is why I think you have the Dust to Dawn and Dawn to Dawn sites as well. Um, and so, like I said, this is a multi-tiered uh, thing that we as a city, I don't believe, can do by ourselves. But that said, we certainly can join the Human Services Commission and the Poverty and Homeless Board and do what pieces make sense for our community. Um, I think the cahoots style operation that's also being discussed is just a great opportunity for our community. I hope to see it successful. I think, you know, looking at the low income housing, um, you know, reevaluating the MUPTI or the LERPTI that's being proposed, I think these are all great ideas to try to help, you know, get some housing for the folks. Uh, that do that. I do also want to correct a little comment Richard made. You know, our agency is a community service center, so we do help folks with ID assistance, basic needs assistance, uh, housing, and energy assistance. And so we actually, um, I did a guesstimate that we we're pumping about a million dollars a year under normal years into our community to help uh, low-income citizens. So, you know, there's a huge impact that's already in place. What we need to do is connect those services with the other folks that are doing this great work. Um, so, so we do those um, uh, ID assistance. In fact, we have a letter that folks can take to the DMV if they don't have an address uh, that allow them to get um, identification. So there are a lot of pieces. We do a housing program. Uh, it's called Home Ten Tenant-Based Assistance, which is designed to get unhoused folks into housing. But once again, uh, we have to find, not only find housing um, for that person, but it has to pass a HUD inspection. 
which can be a challenge as well. Um, and like I said, I feel like I'm getting in the weeds, so I'm going to stop at that. But just to say that the housing first model really is a win-win. So what we're doing is we are actually saving the community money. And I know, you know, this isn't a blanket, everybody saves money, but, uh, and I think Council Urban at a previous uh, meeting had said, well, we'd like to document it. I think that's a great idea. Let's document what the costs are uh, to do these programs versus the costs that we're already paying. And I mean that with the jails, with the cleanups, with the hospitals. Um, you know, I think that's fair. I think that's very fair to ask, is this program actually making sense? So I certainly want to commend counselors for asking those questions. But for me, the win-win is that not only do I believe we'll save money, we're enhancing the lives of our citizens in the process. You know, both the ones who are impacted by, the, by those folks unfortunate enough to be unhoused, but also for the lives of those who are unhoused. And so once again, I just think we need to really connect with the county. Um, I am fully in support of using some of these uh, stimulus dollars to help create a camp, um, whether that's an opportunity village, whether it's a dust to dawn, whether it's a tiny homes. I think all are great ideas. Um, I think that our agency is also going to try to step up and uh, get, we're going to be doing uh, coordinated entry, which will get folks into that county system for permanent supportive housing. Um, I, there's so much more to say, but I'm going to stop right there because I don't want to go into the wee hours of the morning. But, but please, anybody who wants to ask me, or better yet, ask the folks on the Poverty and Homeless Board about these issues, because this is a very complicated issue. And thank you so much for listening. Councillor Savage. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I want to tug at heartstrings for a second. I have a really dear friend of mine who is a single mom. She has a child with some extreme disabilities and she struggled working because she couldn't find childcare for her son. She had a great job. She has a master's degree and loves what she does. But because she couldn't find childcare and adequate education for her child, she found herself working less and less because she was calling in. Granted, she was covered by FMLA, but at some point that doesn't cover her paycheck. Her rent was increased and her income decreased and she found herself homeless on the streets of Eugene with her son with disabilities. I looked at her and found myself in her just in different shoes. I too have a son with a disability. I too had to leave a career that I had set in place for myself because I could not find childhood. And this is all too common. It's a similar story, different scenario for so many folks who are homeless, who are unhoused. After about nine months and lots of help and support and guidance through the mission in Eugene, she was able to finally get into a, a one bedroom studio and has resided there for the last year and a half. Thank goodness it's been during the pandemic. Watching her struggle has been insanely hard because I've known her for 38 years. But watching her regain her sanity, regain services for her son has been so empowering to know that we can get through this, but we have to get it through. We have to get through it. I don't believe that we should do nothing because we could be on the streets. It could be us. I think that we need to come together, but I don't believe in handouts because nothing is free and that's not okay. It shouldn't cost somebody else so much. There's that saying that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So I fully believe in transitional housing where there are requirements that could be tailor-made to folks specifically just for them. If there are health challenges in place, let's help them get to those health challenges, but let's require them to work somehow, some way. What can they do? 
would I work with my own children? I don't want to give them things. I want them to earn things. It feels better. It feels better as the recipient. I myself have a really hard time receiving, but I love working because it feels good. We're human. We're meant to work. We're meant to help each other. And folks who don't have housing feel that same thing. They don't want things handed to them for free. They want to feel valued and worthy of where they're supposed to be. So I truly believe that we should utilize those resources within the folks who are unhoused. How can we help them help themselves? It's not a handout, it's a hand up. I think that there's going to be a lot of different answers here and it's going to take a lot of different resources. I love the idea of partnering with different folks. We can't do it alone. We have to do it together. I think it's been pushed down to the city level because at the city level, we have boots on the ground. We know their names. They are our neighbors. I like the idea of allowing RVs and tiny houses on wheels to be able to be parked in permitted driveways and permitted spaces. This allows the city to regulate the different um, RV choices and tiny home choices that are being made. I believe that we have city code for a reason and we should enforce that. And so to have city code say that we can't camp on our streets, we should for enforce that, but let's provide a way that folks can still manage. What if there's somebody who has their um, space on a property where their RV can, can be parked? That could be permitted. We could go on six foot permits. We could go on year long permits so that the city is regulating what RVs, what tiny homes are out there and it's still able to be permitted. The RV has to be drivable. The, dri the plates have to be current. There are regulations, there are still rules that have to be followed, but there are also accommodations being made and you're still holding up code. Um, I would like to hear from folks who are unhoused. And the reason I say that is I think of my husband who's a chef who works at kitchens and he can walk into a kitchen and he says, wow, this was not designed by a chef. And I can tell. I would like to hear from folks who are unhoused right now because they will tell us what they need. But I don't think it should all be free. There needs to be some work in it. They need to have skin in the game too. And I think that they want that. I think that they want to have skin in the game. They want to be valued. So how do we do that together? I don't have all the answers and I don't know, but the demographics that I'm hearing are seniors, veterans, folks with mental illness, folks who experience domestic violence, and folks who have health issues. We can most definitely look at those programs and we can tailor made a scenario that works for them so that folks can feel that and they can work hard and they can earn the ability to have those four walls, even if it's not a monetary payment, like I'm paying the rent. Maybe they're working the grounds of a transitional unit. Maybe somebody else is an incredible chef and can help cook meals. There's different things that we can look at. So that's my two cents. Thank you so much for listening. Councilor Stennett. I think, um, We've heard a few times this evening, and I think all of us would concede that this is a complicated, complex issue. It would require a multi-pronged approach and the buy-in and efforts and talents of a lot of, a lot of people. Um, what I do personally helps me to try, to try to understand and get my head around the complicated issue is that I try to distill it down and um, to try to find the common ground where we could all come together and not even be able to find a way to disagree on what the issue is and what needs to be done. Um, I went, I, I, 
I know that Cottage Grove is great at doing that because I've been watching it since I've been here, both you know, as a reporter, as a as, uh, citizen, as a father, as, as you know, a member of a lot of organizations. Um, I went this morning and talked a very insightful and interesting conversation with uh, Captain Gagnon, Cottage Grove Police, um, most specifically to ask about the uh, folks uh, camping there behind the community center, but of course the conversation got broader and a little more complex than that. Um, and I said, what, you know, what, what is the situation there? What are those, uh, are these people that are new to Cottage Grove? Um, is this a new situation for them? And, uh, basically told me that um, there's nobody there that, that police don't already know, really. These, these are uh, folks that maybe they weren't camping there a few months ago but um, experiencing a different iteration of that same situation somewhere else, some other way close by, whether it's in the woods to the north or south of town, there are a lot of different, you know, a lot of folks couch surf and do what they can. When they can, they'll move on when that situation is untenable. Um, what I heard there was that those are, uh, those are community members. Those are Grovers. Um, they don't have the means that some of us do. Um, We've got a harder road to hoe than a lot of us. We've got a complex set of factors that make it very difficult to climb out of that situation. I spent the summer looking for housing um, in Cottage Grove because I desperately wanted to stay in this community. It, it was disheartening every day, and I had the means to do something about it. If I found a place and I didn't, it's not there. This housing market is brutal. There, you hear a lot of pronouns when the uh, homeless discussion comes up. How did they get like this? What should we do for them? What can we do about those people? There is no they. They is us. This is our problem. What should we do about it? You can, you can distill the issue down even further if you want to get into the community center, I think, because it's, it's about how do we use our public land? Is that the highest use of that land? Is that what it was intended for? Of course not. Should people be living? back there? Probably not. Is that the best option? Probably not. I would support finding a better facility in which to, to do this thing. We have a, we have city land with shelters on them. Um, if nothing else, couldn't that be our dust to dawn option for now as we struggle, as we work to get that staffed and we work to bring people together to do address some of these other issues that are complex that we have talked about. Um, I would support more and more stakeholder meetings that bring people together to let us know that this is not, this is not occurring in a vacuum. It's, there's the notion that there, but by the grace of God, go I. I mean, we've said it before and again, it could, it could be you, it could be me. I don't think there's anyone that would walk, if they discovered that a close friend or family member was, was living behind the community center wouldn't do whatever they could. I don't think there's anyone sitting in this room right now that's gonna walk out that door, feel that weather, feel that chill, and decide to stay out there. It's not a choice. They is us. I hope we can get together and do something about this, and uh, I'm, I'm on board. Councilor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Council, for expressing all of this, uh, I have a lot of agreement in it. Uh, for me, I, I've spent the, this time trying to also distill down, you know, these the main issues here, and the relevant one for us, I think, is whose responsibility is this uh, primarily? Uh, and I can't get away from uh, my conviction that this responsibility lies on every individual in the community. Uh, so the real question is, do we collectively as individuals say, okay, we want to direct the city to do, you know, to execute our will for how, how we want to deal with this issue and how we want to serve uh, these populations? Uh, I am very hesitant to do that. Um, and I think it's primarily because I think it, 
it distances all of us individually from bearing that weight and responsibility the way that we need to bear it and feel it. Um, I like when I hear approaches like changing ordinances about being able to have a tiny home on your, your place, uh, to allow a camper uh, to be occupied for however long. To me, that says that opens up the citizens of Cottage Grove to use their discretion, to use their resource, to make uh, personal uh, sacrifice that are rewarding, uh, albeit potentially risky, uh, to to engage. And something about that, the spirit of that feels right to me. It feels like something we need to uh, encourage and, and wisely and to, to come alongside. Uh, I love private uh, enterprise, uh, even, you know, nonprofit uh, solutions where people of common conviction come together and, and, and do the thing that they're committed to do without any, uh, Yeah, I want to be <laughs> without any strings that are unnecessarily attached and uh, unrelated to the, the problem on the ground that they're dealing with. Uh, we are a small community. We're a very neat community. Uh, I'm looking at the names on here, and I have heard uh, in a tremendous amount of uh, passion and, and just experience that there's people here that are doing this day in and day out, serving these populations and, and know it well. Um, and I, I think empowering uh, this community to say, look, this is our this is our situation, this is our deal. Let's interact. Let's help. Uh, a couple notes I have. I don't want the left hand to really know what the right hand is doing uh, in terms of the advertising of services. Uh, that's partly why I want to advocate for kind of personal approaches where it can be. You're meeting a need that you can at the time, and no one really needs to know about that. Um, I also don't really want to telegraph uh, that we're a place to flock to uh, for services. Um, I want the serv I want to be able to provide what's needed uh, here, you know, on an individual basis, not to have disdain, uh, but to have true compassion showing. Uh, but relatively quietly. Uh, in thinking about connecting with the county, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Buck, for being here, you know, I've heard repeatedly, I've had friends that worked in the Johnson unit, ones that currently work in there, you know, why don't we put pressure on these federal dollars and state dollars to reopen the mental hospitals? You know, most of the severe cases that I'm thinking of, that I've, <laughs> that I've had personal interaction with in the parks, um, are those that are in my, at least in my estimation, you know, I'm certainly not going to have, not bring them on my property with young kids nearby. Uh, they're not, they're not something that the individual can really take care of and handle. I do think they need uh, more than, you know, that kind of approach can handle. Uh, and, and many are very un, unstable and uh, can be set off very easily. And that is kind of the role of a, a mental institution to stabilize someone to, you know, to, also protect society and uh, allow people to go about their business focused on what they need to to be productive in society. So I'd like to see um, these public funds and public dollars handling big problems that we can't solve on a, a community level basis. Uh, and I guess that's, you know, I am assuming that we can we can really effectively address our homeless population effectively as a community uh, without a uh, tax-based reoccurring uh, line budget line item for for these services I could be wrong I'd sure like to try it uh, before we throw dollars at it um, yeah and thanks every yeah just thank you everybody for having this conversation look forward to continuing it and uh, look forward to hearing opportunities where you know where we can serve and I, I know I was in a meeting a couple weeks ago and the league attorney, League of Oregon City, she said that, um, 
you know, you kind of got three options. You do nothing, you abide by the law, or you try to do more. And so, you know, as a counselor, you got to kind of figure out what direction you want to go. And I think that's where we kind of need to go. I think we should, you know, my opinion is we put this into some kind of a work session because it, it is a, an agenda all in itself. And, and I think, um, you know, hope, hopefully Commissioner Buck could get some assistance and uh, attend that work session with us from the county level to, to help us brainstorm that. And I think getting public input from people, you know, there's a lot of people on here tonight, if they would, you know, email or submit or contact us somehow and let us know their opinions on it, you know, because it is a community and we need to, to address it as a community. And, you know, if it's going down a path of, you know, we don't want to do this, that's the community saying it, but it's got to be the majority of the people to, to the one there and, and uh, put, put their ideas in there and, and we work it out as a group, as a whole community. And so um, I, I don't know what direction you're looking for tonight, Mr. Myers, but, um, you know, I think exploring some of the options you did give with the, the 99 property and, and, and all that, if we had some kind of um, a, a better plan of how we would do that rather than, you know, this is an idea. It's a great idea, but um, let's, we, if we had better numbers on that and what it would really look like, I think that would be beneficial for this group to make a decision on and knowing that going into it. Because I don't think you've got those numbers this early in the game. No, and and I think I think what I've gotten from the council is like a really good direction and in, in, in thoughts of what we want to do. And so what I'd su suppose uh, propose to do is we'll put together a package that'll show the different options and things that we're suggesting, and maybe have some choices on those, um, and actually flesh out some of these. Like we don't want to go in completely and have a brainstorm because you know. Tonight was a good example. There's a whole mess of rabbit holes that we can go down and as we talk about all the different things that can happen. Um, we, we don't want the council getting bogged down in the day-to-day the -day operations of a transitional housing or of a Don to Don or 24-7 facility. I mean, that's for those people that are managing those to have those rules in place. And there's great examples of that already. They've been tried and true and tested. And, and, some of them are just phenomenal in what they've addressed and how they're doing that. And they're even addressed in going through, um, you know, working with Carry It Forward, their staff are people who have been in the situation already as well. And, you know, so they can understand and know what can help people get out of it and, and use them in the process. And so we'll partner with some more of those. But what I'd suggest is I'll, we'll put together a package. We'll meet with their stakeholders groups and others and try to get a package of these different options and have actually some of the ordinances drafted out with different functions and things associated with those so you have a better picture. I have a good idea of what you've talked about and it gives me a good idea we can focus on an area now rather than a big grand picture. Um, I, I think as a result that it sounds like nobody wants to do nothing and just say, hey, everything is, all public land is open and you can camp wherever. So I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that's not where we're going. It, it sounds like we want to be able to solve or address um, the problems and try to make some success or, or fix some things. I've got to turn off the chat before you see the chat. Um, so that's what I'll put together and we'll set a work session date for a kind of review of that and um, we can have some people come and actually talk about some of those options and more specifics from organizations that have done it so you can get a good picture of what some of those things are. Councilor Solsby. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Richard, um, my one question that was pretty important to me was if we did do some sort of transitional housing, but it was full, can people still camp according to this law? Well, yeah, and it, transitional housing is different than your 24-7. And so your transitional housing is a step up above a basic shelter service. 
Um, so transitional housing isn't necessarily going to be for the homeless off the street. That are, that's going to be more for people that have already been in a shelter situation. We have some efforts moving forward with them already. They're ready to move into something where they have more responsibilities. They've got income coming in. They've got some challenges they still need to fix, but they're in that transition. So and that was, I, I wrote that down. We needed to talk about the difference there. What we are to, what we'd be looking at is a shelter system, which would be the initial piece. And if we develop a shelter, um, it will have some flexibility that it can grow because the numbers will vary from night to night. And under Boise versus uh, Martin versus Boise, if your shelter is full, then you cannot enforce citations for camping on public land. Um, they even said in the in the in the court notes that. Even if you have shelter space available, but the shelter space is associated with a religious institution or has some barrier to it that makes it uncomfortable for them, that it's considered full and they don't have to be in that shelter. So we want to make sure we have a shelter system that is free of barriers completely so that um, you have that ability. But you're right. If it is full, then you can't enforce the camping. Those are things that you've got a plan for that's in the law um, and but as long as we have that space they you can have more strict prohibit prohibitions on camping on public land mr myers um the way i read it it actually says additionally the martin court added naturally our holding does not cover individuals who do have access to adequate temporary shelters whether because they have means to pay for it or because it's realistically available available to them for free but choose not to use it so I really have some questions for the attorney and so if you could have her meet with us that would be very helpful for me and then I just had one more concern I'd like to bring up um, I the um, tents over at the community center are those fire retardant I, I i'm worried about what is the city's responsibility if something happens and then also um, i was told by someone that they observed an open flame in the tent right behind your office and so i am concerned about that as well so you might want to look into that um, and what our liability as a city is if some emergency situation comes out of it yeah, and I do agree if we have this as a work session or in a meeting, we need the attorney because the attorney is going to be the one to defend us. So um, I want their input. And it, she was she couldn't be here tonight. She was with another city tonight. Ross was supposed to come, but he didn't make it. So, um, but yeah, and we, we've actually got her response as well to a number of those issues. And um, yeah, it's if, if the facility, and she did respond specifically, your question even if the facilities aren't full but if there is some barrier or some issue that they choose not to go there because it's religious based or or something like that that doesn't count it's not open to them. so that's the, the, the court ruled that way um, and it's interpreted that way through the, the attorneys but um, definitely some of the liability issues are, are there and we're dealing with those this is with our insurance company as well on those right now um, specifically with the warming shelter as a, a prime example as well, um, trying to make sure that those are addressed. And, um, and that's an issue that not only we're trying to address, but we're pressuring the League of Oregon Cities and City County Insurance to figure out how to help us address those because, yeah, they're a liability issue and there's a concern there, but we've still got to do it. It's the same as our, our jails. Um, we're paying through the nose for liability insurance for our city jail. Um, but we're one of five cities in the state, small cities in the state that have a jail because it's important to how we operate and um, we continue to fight that and push that forward as well. And we're going to have to do the same thing here on this issue. But like you say, like I said, it is a, it's one of those issues that's broader than us because it's affecting all of the communities. Um, I did want to talk a little bit too, you know, I, I gave the example of our young, our, our gentleman that's at the, at the community center who has diabetes, he can hardly breathe, and his health issues are so serious. Um, these are people living in tents. 
out in the cold and the moisture and they have these health issues. There are big expenses, ambulance bills, uh, medical costs that are associated with this. That is a great reason and where, like Councillor Fleck said, where you see those cost savings for the community, and those medical expenses that could be avoided if they had proper shelter in where they could actually then also help address some of those health issues. So um, that's a huge savings. We also see the huge savings in yeah, we can go in and clean up camps, but anymore you have to get the 72 hour notice and then when you clean it up, um, they have to move, but they have they move back onto some other public property and then you're cleaning that one and then you're cleaning the next one in three days um, or six days actually, because you have to give them 72 hour notice. Um, before long, you're going to see, and I would imagine, you're going to see that get into um, some kind of court case. And are you harassing and moving people around as a result of their inability to find a place to stay? And is that going to be part of the, the Eighth Amendment the violation as well? So, I mean, we've got to treat them as human beings. They're humans, and they have challenges and problems. And what we can do is try to help them get them back into abilities to control and move through their life and have those resources that we, that's what we need to do. So I think I have a good idea of the, the thoughts and concerns and we'll pull some things together and try to put together a work session in the next year. Councilor Fleck. So and while the chat, sh the chat should not have been enabled, it did bring up a good point that youth homelessness is a huge issue. Um, although different, you know, homeless uh, is different uh, depending on HUD or whatnot, but even folks doubled up certainly need or couch surfing uh, need that support as well. And I do want to recognize that. Um, I will note Johnny Green is our new representative here in town and they are here at the meeting. And so I would want to include them and they're in Richard's group as well. Uh, but I just wanted to also point that the youth are also uh, certainly ones I would want to consider as well. And, and, and the youth situation is a whole nother, I mean, a whole nother rabbit hole to go down. I mean, they've got so many issues and challenges that are, that even, that are even more difficult than handling the adults. Portion. But, you know, I, I do want to commend the council, you know, in the budget um, last year or in the current year, we, we provided $15,000 to help with the glass, get their building up and run, to, to help with their campaign. And we're going to continue to help looking glass move. That's what, where Johnny is from and represents. And so if nobody knows that, uh, help them get that all squared away because they they concentrate and know how to deal with you. And if you want to use their expertise, you can deal with that and help. Um, we have a number of youth that they've helped. Um, you know, it's the same thing with some of the McKinney Vinto stuff in the school district. Um, and, and I think this goes back to and reflects what's going on with some of the youth homes the adult homeless that we have. Um, we've got youth that are working through those programs and they're housing because there's no housing for youth in Cottage Grove. They're housing them in Eugene, but they want to come and continue to go to school here in Cottage Grove. And so they, they transport them back to Cottage Grove because this is their home and they want to be here, but they, they need those other services. So we desperately need to start looking at yeah, helping them and continue to move forward the mission of Brooklyn Glass as they, they develop their building better and, and those services. So yeah, that's a big piece. The other piece that we haven't even talked about that's a whole other issue are families. I mean, how do we deal with families and try to provide something on, on that sense? And you know, that's where I think some of those those opportunities that Councilor Urban was pointing out as well, where we've got families helping families on their own property um, because there are special conditions you don't want families associated and in the uh, single adult man or those kind of programs and, and you know, so you just can't fix that. Um, you want to protect everyone as much as you can uh, because, you know, quite frankly, and this is one of the challenges with any of the homeless facilities or the, the pop-up camp grounds and campsites that have happened is you've got homeless people there and you've got victims and you've got people that are victimizing those, those facilities. And we want to try to protect them as much as we possibly can. Um, that, that just compounds it and makes it more difficult for them to get out of their situation. Okay. Sure. 
um, when you state that if if our if we build a shelter, if we have a shelter, and if it's full, these um, folks can pretty much go anywhere on public land. Um, what if, and, and I don't know the answer to this, if there was a space for tents, you know, here's a space. So that means that our city park is now off limits because here is an adequate space. And that's exactly what I mentioned. Bay North Bend, what we would suggest is having another ordinance that sets sort of policies that say, when this is full, here's the other facility that you can go to to prevent that place that you don't want to be. So we still have some control and some connection that we know this is where they're going to be if we need to put them there. We've kind of done that already with the community center, the north side, the west side of City Hall, it's the other side if that's what we're building. Um, so that would be considered a facility per se, because here is a space where you can, which means you cannot over there. And, and one of the things we've looked at as we develop a dawn to dawn facility is, yeah, we have it set basically for a certain number most of the time, but we still have an opportunity to have tents in the stands and possibility, because there'll be fluctuation on that. Um, and, you know, we're not attracting people, and that's what they found in most of the communities that um, serve the population of homelessness. They're not attracting people from out of the area. What we're doing is we're finding people that are high or that we just don't see because they're busy. They're, they're bunking with someone else, or they're, they're, I mean, we have a lot of land around the cottage row that are just great hiding places, and people are camping there. Um, I'll go back to the 99 site. We know that just across the Highway 99, the side of the tracks, there's a sizable population of homeless living there. Um, that's one of the pluses of that site, is then they can do some outreach, get those people back in, so I can get the services in that base so that they can get, get the opportunities to opportunities to address some of their needs. So we, we need to be able to have some of that outreach, get some folks pulled in, uh, are we ever going to solve homelessness? I don't think so. I, mean, I think it's been around since the first cave that was developed. Somebody, somebody else did get one. There, it's been around that long, and it's going to continue to be around. But if we can get to a point where they call it a net zero, where we're taking care of people quickly in some of the, the easy cases out and back in the regular traditional housing or into some of the more supported housing, that we continue to feeding the system and getting these people back in, but we're also addressing a new one. Um, youth is a great example. I mean, anything we can do to help youth from getting into that and continuing the trend that they've probably had for their whole life um, and breaking that cycle, we're doing success. We're having big success. We may not solve all of it. There's going to be the chronic ones that desperately need some other state intervention on a more regional or statewide approach that we just can't do with cheap um, But uh, we need to get the ones we can and get them back into a quality of life that they can Thank you for taking the time to clarify. <laughs> Hopefully that helps. Yeah. All right. So you got your direction. Yeah. It's okay. really broad, but hey, we'll. we'll and then, on focus. Well, and then, then that'll also give us some things to really talk about and say, yeah, this works, or let's tweak yeah. this a little bit. So, wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Report from the city manager. Um, since I've talked a lot already, I will try to keep this as short as I possibly can. Um, yeah, we signed the agreement with the Community Sustainability Challenge um, on, on Friday, and um, they got it back to us today. Um, it's basically what the, the program is it's a website that we are working directly with all of our uh, utilities, and that's what took a while, was meeting with all the different utilities and, and creating a dialogue with them and getting them involved in the process too. And so it'll be a web page that will have challenges associated with it. So you click on the energy conservation, and you can pick changing out all your light bulbs to LED. It will tell you what kind of savings you can have for the year, um, what kind of footprint that would change. Um, and, and how that would apply. So we've worked with PPNL and we've worked with EPA, and they're both on. There's natural gas companies in there as well that we've worked with the Northwest Natural Gas. We've gotten in touch with them. Northwest Natural Gas has not been in touch with us 
for decades. And we were able to get the, uh, the corporate uh, governmental affairs person to actually come and visit, and they're excited to participate. Um, we've also visited the DEQ, our, our state DEQ on solid waste. They're involved and they're supportive of the program and they, they're going to do anything they can to help us. And, and these are all commitments and, and discussions that we've had to, to be able to use some of the features of this program in recycling and waste reduction to actually satisfy some of our state law requirements that we as a 10,000 population city have to be making sure that we're doing some promotion of the uh, reduce and use of citizens and leaders. So that was all the, the efforts that we went through there and we're excited that we've got all of those features on um, and going to be moving forward. It's a voluntary program. People can sign up. They can sign up a neighborhood and as a neighborhood you can compete against other neighborhoods or your church or your your American Legion Hall can compete against the veterans of the Fair Wars in the city. And people can sign on in groups and um, they get points. And, we're, we're hoping, and as through those discussions with the other utility, we're hoping we also have incentive. So if you get to a certain point level, you can get a free shower head, or you get your nest, or you get things that can help you move forward with some of those as well. So that's kind of what it is. Um, it's a, a fun little program, and thanks we'll be sitting down with a kickoff with them and going through how to formulate a lot of it. It's all kind of pre-packaged, but um, we'll be putting that together for us. Um, there was an opportunity to do it with the county. The county is kind of even slower than we are, and so it just didn't quite get together. And, and we wanted to try to make it tied directly to how to grow you know, the So that's what we're working on. Um, with some of the stuff that is happening, I think you even saw in the Friday update, we are green our Christmas lights. They're actually still white, red, and blue, and stuff like that, but they are green Christmas lights. We are actually saving. Um, as a result of the green power that we used for those, we're saving 2,260 pounds of CO, um, carbon dioxide. And so that's that's a great program we're partnering with um, and Alpine. Um, just for your reference, um, in the year 2020, um, we actually purchased 100% green power on all of our city functions. And as a result of that, we had 2,277 2, metric tons of carbon dioxide that was reduced or prevented as a result of our green power that we had purchased. Um, that's the equivalent of driving 5, 000, 5, and some thousand miles, which our vehicles don't do that. Um, we don't drive that far in our vehicles. And so we're making a difference there. One of the other pieces that we were excited to talk to DEQ about is our purchase of the bridge beams um, that we're buying. Um, they are calculating for us right now what the carbon dioxide energy consumption savings would be as a result of us buying used bridge buying getting them for free um, and storing them. <laughs> but the savings that we will get in carbon dioxide and other energy as a result of buying those already made, they've already been used once and they won't spoil. We will take them to our site and store them. Those are huge things that um, make a difference and we're significantly making a difference in that way. Um, we already talked about the shelters open tonight and some of the things that happened as a result of that. We, we did have to meet with, uh, Ruth was on here, um, but we did meet with Beds for Freezing Nights, looking at are you ready to take over and continue to do a congregate facility or do this to happen? And that required some discussion as well as we were getting started with um, the program. It, to get that up and running in time for it to happen. So um, it, that did delay and help a, a little bit move forward there. And we did this tonight. I don't think there was one wrong with the photos, I'm sure, already yet. That's what was surprising. We had some warm weather. Um, but we are open tonight and tomorrow night. And so that'll be exciting. And yes, this is Trudy's last meeting. We're sad to see her go. And we at least we gave her something to say, yeah, I went more than two hours. Um, <laughs> But she's also going to leave happy that, hey, I don't have to do the minutes. Mindy gets to do it. <laughs> but we are going to miss you, Trudy. Thank you so much for the 12 years. It's been, it's been fun. It's been great. Yeah, it's always fun. But hey, that's part of, part of doing it. Um, you will sorely be missed. And thank you to everyone who did come to her, her extravaganza retirement <laughs> celebration on, on Thursday. It was a lot of fun. 
Um, and um, it, was, it was great to see people from the beginning of her career. Even there. No one was there from, from um, Reed Sport that was with her there. So um, it should be great with this. And we're excited to have Mindy on as well. And so it's kind of cool that we have two city reporters right now because Mindy started December 1st. Um, doesn't happen very often. Um, like we mentioned, um, Thursday night, Trudy is the 21st city recorder in our history since 1887. So um, that's that's a good club of, of people to be a member of. And we had some that served multiple years at different times and breaks, but um, it's it's great to have her in that list of people. And thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you realize how difficult it is to do those minutes and the minutes that you adopted today in the consent agenda, bring her completely up to date with minutes. Um, and that's, that's phenomenal. And having been a city manager slash city recorder in a previous city, um, what an insurmountable task. Well, and I also did the minutes for the planning commission, so that I needed even more insurmountable. But, um, you get interrupted, you get disturbed, you get phone calls, you get all these things that you're trying to do minutes and keeping up to date on those is great. Greatly appreciate that and her efforts in cleaning up our records and getting our retention schedule and our public records request program. All of those things really tightened up has been great and really stepping into a position that is in a great position for her to just take even more so. Um, I won't say any more because either I will or her will start crying. <laughs> but, and that's all I have. All right. We have no attorney. There's no items removed. We're adjourned. Thank you. Thanks. Stick around, everybody.